All right, hello and welcome to the Writing Research Book Cover Stream. We are going to look at a lot of book covers and, among other things, try to guess the plot. We're also going to discuss what makes a good book cover, the different genre tropes of covers in addition to texts, and some of my thought process with the Something's Not Right cover at the very end. All right, we're starting with YA because I think YA is, if nothing else, familiar. Everyone thinks they know what a YA cover is, and so it's fairly easy to talk about the tropes of YA covers. It's also, I think, because YA, a lot of YA is romance, and there's a lot of overlap with romance covers. For a lot of different reasons, it's just a very polarizing location to look for a book cover. So this is one that I haven't seen before, and this is what I tried to do, is I tried to look through upcoming, popular, whatever books that I have not read and don't know anything about. I've never seen this book in person, for example, and I work in a bookstore, so that's that is to say that I have no way of knowing anything about it, other than that I got this image from Goodreads and I just didn't look at the, the blurb. So all right, what do we have? A nominally handwritten font. We have two figures. <laughs> this is going to get terrible immediately because you have to communicate a lot of different ideas through covers and I immediately think, oh, well, it's two girls, but you know, what does that mean? Are the butts feminine? Um, there's different fashion styles. There's the way that their hands and legs are interlinked. There's obviously the car referenced, I assume, in the title. We have what I would call an author's name of reasonable size, which is silly because of course, you know, when Stephen King's name is extremely large on a cover, it's not actually unreasonable, it makes perfect sense, but it's easier if we, we have a sense for what I would consider quote unquote normal author sizing. Um, this is interesting. So the, their tagline is three girls, two crushes, one summer, which already throws me off a little bit because my first assumption would have been we see that the way that they're interlocked is a little precarious, I would say, with the legs. If it was just the hands, I would think, oh, you know, they have such a stable, cute little relationship, but there's something sort of awkward. And of course, you know, my first car definitely gives us a an age range. And of course, it's YA, so, you know. And I should note that I how do I know this is YA? Because when I look at this, the title implies a first experience, um, often had as a young person. The figures look young, they are dressed like young people, and they, for all intents and purposes, look like young people. Theo is having a really good time in the chat. I, my first Im impression of this, my first assumption is that this is going to be centered around, you know, the awkwardness of growing up, which of course you could say about almost any YA title, but this one in specific, we're getting the sense of, you know, Ode to My First Car, it's kind of incongruous idea of, you know, an ode um, to something that one would not think needed to be lauded. I'm going to be honest with you, that car doesn't look that attractive, not because it's a bad book cover, because, you know, your first car. Um... I also don't know anything about cars, so it's it's fair to say that it could be a really attractive car. I have no idea. I like that it's green. Imagine if it was owed to my first car, and the car in the background was one of those, you know, like, dark, gray, hideous... Anyway, it, it can't be, because the YA cover that's trying to be sort of cute and fun, so they have to do a lot of pastel colors as well. I'm trying to figure out what the third girl is, if not the car. <laughs> Two crushes, one summer. Makes sense that it's over the summer. I feel like a lot of summer books have this sunsetty background with the clouds. Two crushes, is it? So okay, let, let's see. If I'm if I'm defining this as maybe something about figuring yourself out, growing up, this, the struggles and awkwardness of that age. Maybe there's kind of a fake out with the love interest, where you know it's like I want to get this girl, but you realize you're actually interested in another girl. I don't want to say 
fake dating or, you know, dating to make someone jealous because I don't know. I, I, that's not really what I get from this cover. I get this more like we're trying to be together, but we're not very good at it yet because we're teenagers. Um, that's all I could offer, I think. Does anyone else have any further guesses on the plot of the book before we actually investigate it? Love triangle is also a really good idea. But again, I just, if it was a love triangle, why wouldn't they put the third girl on the cover? Just like a pen pal thing? Distance? I mean, that's the one thing I can't figure out is if there, if this wasn't here, I would immediately say, oh, of course, it's about this girl's, you know, summer growing up and she's dealing with a lot of things. Maybe she's even, you know, going to college soon. Just think about that. Um, summer is a great transitional space for growing up because it's a period between um, more obviously marked age ranges between grades, for example, and it makes a big difference to be in an, a higher grade. So you have this space where you're able to reflect on the fact that you're aging. I j who is the third girl? <laughs> okay, that could be it. That perhaps, um, as Kyle is putting in the chat, two girls who are best friends have a crush on a third girl. That does make sense to me. And it might explain why they're, they have this entanglement going on. Literal entanglement. Um, Ayn says, what's intriguing me is the miscount between girls and crushes. Which girl doesn't have a crush? Or is it one girl with both? I assumed it was one girl with both. Two main characters of a crush. So are they? I think there's only one main character. I don't think that this is going to be a a multi POV story because how can you do that without having all of them on the cover? I think we have to figure out what's actually going on here. This new girl isn't a main character. I don't know. I think I'm going to find out. I think that's all I can guess at this point. Told in verse. That's very clever. I didn't guess that. Ode to my first car. That's very funny. Okay. Ooh, here it is. What I I should have said friends to because I that's exactly what this looks like. It's a few months before senior year. Okay, we're close to college. And Claire Camp, closeted bisexual, is finally starting to admit she might be falling in love with her best friend Sophia, who she's known since they were four. Trying to pay off the fine from the crash that totals was large, her beloved car, of course. Claire takes a job at the local nursing home up the street from her house. That is a lot more literal with the aging and growing up theme than I thought. There she meets, oh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't like being Slavic because it makes me feel like I have to pronounce it correctly. Yeah, an 88 year old lesbian woman who tells her stories. Oh, it could just be Lena. That's worse though. <laughs> I'm so sorry if it is Lena, I just said that. Um, Lesbian one who tells her stories about what it was like growing up gay in the 1950s and 60s. I didn't guess that. As Claire spends more time with Lena, Lena, depending on her country of origin, and grows more confident of her identity, another girl, Penn, comes into the picture of Claire's cop between two loves, one familiar and well worn, the other new and untested. Okay, this makes sense to me why there isn't a third girl on the cover. I am imagining in my head, you know, there, there's definitely a style of cover they could have done that would be a lot more... Um, I don't want to say conventional. This is a conventional cover, but you know, the, the classic, there's three people on the cover and they're all kind of smiling at each other. They're, they're smizing, they're DreamWorks smizing at each other. And there's like a flat color background and then a title and an author and then a blurb from, you know, a, a, a big name author. Um, right. Well, I do also think that the whole best friend, but then having this kind of fake out the love interest, like who are they going to end up with? It's kind of a love triangle, but I, I, I don't read this as love triangle, love triangle, because I associate love triangle with, you know, like twilight, like, like, I don't want to say high stakes, but a context where 
the main character is more spends more of the book torn, seriously torn between two people. Um, but I the verses that's a very cute addition that I did not call from this, and I wonder if I could call it from a cover. I don't know if I could. I don't know that I know the cover tropes for books and verse enough to do that. And I also think that books and verse have left their their most recent boom, which was in the, the 2010s. A lesbian woman, as opposed to a lesbian man. Um, very interesting. And I, this is definitely what I was getting, the sense of, you know, coming into yourself and, you know, sort of exploring the self and, and confidence. That makes sense to me. This one, now I, I promise I'm not cheating. I have seen this book around and I, I do think about the back cover, but I wanted to talk about the elements of the cover nonetheless, because I think this is such a, you know, obvious one that it's a pretty good example. First of all, I really like this art. It's really delicate and nice. There's another one on my list that has also really, really lovely shaded complex art. Um, I hate to fall into the, you know, oh, the, the best one, yes, the, the detail, you know, very difficult, effort intensive, obviously effort intensive art. You know, that sounds, I think, boring and annoying, but I, I do like this art style. I'll say that. I love it. He was immediately accusing them of mirroring the boat, which we don't, that's fair. But I think it works for what they're trying to do, right? They're like on opposite world. It has to be mirrored kind of exactly, I think, to really make that come through. Um, I didn't notice the text changing color across the, the cover the first time I saw this. That's really nice. I love the bubbles interacting with the text. I'll warn you that it's going to come up a lot. I really like when the text is interacted with in some way by the cover art. I think that one of the easiest ways to make a cover look higher effort is to just have any interaction at all between the text and the art because it's difficult to, you know, slot it in there. It takes some effort. I think there are tools that can do it for you to be fair in some programs, but it looks at least on the surface like something that couldn't be made in Canva, which is obviously not a necessary element of a cover, but. Okay, let's see. What is by her hand? Great question. Oh, a ladybug. I didn't even notice that. That's really fun. That is really fun. Why did they add that? I think they probably just thought, oh, this space looks a little empty. We have to put something in here. Um, well, okay. So this is, a, I think, pretty obvious in part because it just says, can true love conquer death? Um, always isn't forever. I wonder what that could mean. And then, you know, you have, uh, there's something strange to me about, I know that my assumption from reading this, and again, I've just forgotten what I read in the plot summary, so that's what I'm using here, is that this character has lost her man, who, you know, she thought she would be with always, but always isn't forever, and he drowned, I'm guessing, which is interesting because <laughs> there's a part of me that is like, are we depicting his the process of his death on the cover of the book, which we obviously are not, it's metaphorical, and I also really love the, the texturing of the, the light, oh, it looks so good. Um, the way they've used warm and cool colors to visually separate the worlds they're in. You know, they didn't have to make this as warm as it feels, but first of all, it does feel like she's kind of on top of the boat, you know, sun tanning. Um, you know, in the light of day, very Orpheus, Eurydice, the hands almost touching, almost but not quite. They can't touch because they're in different worlds. Um, you've got the the author name at the top, and then you have the New York Times bestselling author, of course, because if you've ever sold anything anywhere, you have to have a New York Times bestselling. And I'm not insulting the author saying that. I'm just saying that there's, if you can say something about the author, you're going to say something about the author. You can say that the book is New York Times bestselling. If you can say that it was, I've seen, you know, finalists, I've seen like long listed for the Pulitzer Prize on books from, you know, like, think like 2007, you know, when you would think no one remembers this other than the author. Um, the font is interesting because it's not, you know, like this, this one I think is more of a, a quote unquote tropey font where it's this 
handwritten caps, you know, it looks like it was chalked on by the main character. Whereas this is much cleaner comparatively, and I wonder if that's to contrast with the very handmade feel of the art. In this one, I'm, I'm doing much less in terms of guessing things. Um, I'm just talking about all the cover elements that I really like here. Okay. But, and I did know this. I, I This was also what I thought when I saw this book was You've Reached Sam. Do we have You've Reached Sam down here? We don't, which is really silly because I feel like if you like this book, you just read You've Reached Sam, which I have not read, which I have not read for the record. Well, there's Max and there's Carthage. But for those who don't know, um, it's a YA romance. And if you're, I mean, you're seeing it, right? Different worlds. I will say here he's crossing over, which makes sense for the plot, which I'll describe in a moment, and their hands are slightly touching, but it's the same set of tropes. Um, even, you know, not similar art style at all, but similar sense of like very detailed art that I think is sometimes associated with being more emotional. You know, you want to get this less fun, you know, carefree feeling, and so you do all this really effortful line work. I also really like that the cherry blossoms are on the tree here, but here they're drifting away, you know, they're already gone. Just really great visual metaphors. Does he have, oh, I thought his, his jeans were ripped, but I only saw the back part, and I was like, those are really interesting distressed jeans. Anyway, this is the one about, you know, gal who has a boyfriend who dies, and then she's thinks that she's hearing him through the phone. Um, right, calls his cell phone to listen to his voicemail, and he picks up the phone, so she is able to communicate with him somehow through the phone. Um, I have not read it. I am excited about it. I think that I would really like it, but I haven't read it, and I've only heard good things. I've heard that, you know, everyone cries when they get to, you know, whatever the, the climax of the twist is. So this makes perfect sense as a comparison title, because that's literally what we're looking at. I had a boyfriend. He died. What do we do now? Um... Tragically drowns in a boating accident. Wasn't a lot left to the imagination there. Right, I forgot that this was the plot. I forgot this was the plot. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Only it won't be as simple as bringing him back to life. Instead, Hart's soul is transferred to the body of local, of local bad boy. I think of the local bad boy. When Hart returns to town as Jameson, he realizes that winning Ruby back will be more challenging than he'd imagined. For one, he's forbidden from telling Ruby the truth. And with each day he spends as Jameson, memories of his life as Hart begin to fade away. Though Ruby still mourns Hart, she can't deny that something is drawing her to Jameson. As much as she doesn't understand this other pole, it can't be ignored. And why does he remind her so much of Hart? Desperate to see if the connection she feels is real, Ruby begins to open her heart to Jameson. But will their love be enough to bridge the distance between them? <laughs> I forgot <laughs> I love that having read this, I read this blurb before because I was curious about the book and I forgot. I just forgot that there was a, I don't know, Kyle. And I think that was a question that I had when I was reading the blurb that I, I you know, it, I think that for the, the kind of reader that is more interested in a body swap romance, they will be drawn in by that. Like, well, what are the mechanics of this? For me, I admittedly, because I'm not really a, I'm not a body swap in this context person. Um, I just went, okay, I don't understand what's just happening. Which is also a good time to mention that book covers are not meant to only pull readers in. They're also meant to push readers away if the book isn't right for them. Ideally, of course, everyone would buy your book and you make so much money, blah, blah, blah. But also, ideally, you want that book to do well. You want the press to be good. You want people to like it. Um, it doesn't really make sense to try to push this book, you know, on sci-fi fans, for example, because they're probably not going to like it. And if they don't like it, they're probably not even going to buy it, right? And especially in an online retailer uh, situation, you really don't want to be pushing books to people who don't like them because they will return them and you will lose a lot of money on returns, there is a lot at stake in making sure that the book reaches the right person. There was a really good post, actually, from Shannon McGuire on Tumblr recently. 
about how authors get paid, and I won't get too into it because it's a little bit of a sidebar, but in very, very brief, the publisher makes money in a very strange way where, you know, they, they sell the books to the bookstore, but that's not a guaranteed earning necessarily because, okay, well, what if the books don't sell and the bookstore wants to return them for not selling, which can be done at a certain period of time? What if the books sell, but those books get returned? So you, you really are concerned as a publisher, are you spending too much money shipping books left and right when you're just going to get these returns and have that be a complete random sunk cost? So you also want to make sure that with a cover like this, you're pulling in people who are interested in this like tragic why romance feeling, and maybe that's one of the reasons the text is this, you know, cleaner almost, more, I don't want to say more webby design, but something about the, the, the stricter lines of it make it look more somber than the other text. I do have a lot of questions about this plot. Well, if, if someone reads this book, please let me know. But, so there's one. This one I'm, I'm very curious about because every time I see this cover, I get so excited. I just think it's such a great cover. Um, gay people, famously. And I have no idea what it's about. I feel like I immediately know the, the, the vibe here. But, yeah, I don't know. Um, let's see. So what do we have? Let's kind of go top to bottom, I think, is the way to do it. First of all, I just have to say, this art, gorgeous. I mean, really, really. It. I have seen such a boom in books coming out, I think, especially this specific year, in books with this kind of similar art style, very detailed, effortful, painterly aesthetic. Um, I'm not sure if there's something about this art style that appeals to me because of the content of the books. I did mention, and I stand by this, that perhaps a more detailed art style, a more painterly art style is also signaling, you know, more complex emotions. You know, this is not going to be as lighthearted, maybe, or this one is, you know, examining some kind of theme or something like that. Um, and maybe that's why I'm so drawn to them, because... Admittedly, I, my favorite types of books always are very complex and have a lot of, you know, highs and lows. I don't just want the, the cuteness. Um, so let's start at the top. We have this interesting glitch effect. I really like where it's placed. I really, really like it. It mirrors the, the text effect here at the bottom, but it's, it's not behind the character, so it's not overshadowed. You see it very clearly. It's near the text, so you're sure to have your eye drawn, but not right behind it so that it's not, you know, making it difficult to read. You have that motel sign. I mean, really have to shout out the details in this art where they've managed to put, to basically draw text right in the background and not make it distracting, not make you go, what's the first thing I see on this cover? Motel, right? But then still be able to see it and contextually know, okay, we're in a motel, maybe kind of a, a seedy vibe, this repeated wallpaper over here. Um, there's no checking out of room nine. So we're getting this kind of dark, you know, I'm, I don't want to say horror. I'll say that because when I look at this cover, I, I don't see horror. I see more thriller. I see kind of an investigative sense. Something about just her holding the camera makes me think like they're here to figure out what's going on. You know, it doesn't feel like they're here on vacation and then bad things start happening. Also, I love the, the look on their face. The way you can see the furrowed brow is just, oh, it. Yes, I'm just I'm so happy. Even like the little detail of the the mole on her face, it's just, it's it, literally exciting to me. The way the hair is drawn, the way this little like swoop comes back here, it just, it's so, so cool. Um, I also have to say, this is so, this fashion. <laughs> Every internet lesbian, the like, you know, a little, a little masculine of conventional um, jewelry, the tight shirt, tummy exposed, and then the, this exact fit and color, the colorful pants. And then I also love the, 
relatively complex. Again, dress here that's going on. This is a whole design. So, okay, what, what do we think the relationship is here? They, I'm going to say, are on good terms. <laughs> um, not just, you know, that they, they get together in the book necessarily, but I think that they, they don't start out as, as rivals or something, or even strangers necessarily. I don't think this is necessarily a forced together story. It could be, um, but I, I don't think so. Oh, that's another really good note from Kyle. I like the whole, she's looking at her, but the other one's looking at us. Great point. Lighting is very good. Um, the hair, the Lara Croft, the thumb ring. That's true. Can we, can we shout out the thumb ring? I, this is really, really fun. I really love a detailed cover. I, especially like, I just have to shout out the moles because I've been thinking this recently. One of the reasons I think a lot of the people on the cover of Romance Books, aside from, you know, everyone is white, everyone's cis, et cetera, is that, like, they don't even give these cis white men tattoos. I was thinking, looking at the, the romance section, I was like, give them a birthmark or something. Like, that, these are, you look at some of these books, and the, the two men who are dating don't even look like different men. So what now? Anyway, so I, I'm just shouting out the fact that they, you know, gave her, like, more than one mole. They, like, gave her distinctive little spots, and that's really fun. Um, also because, you know, books will flirt with this idea of, oh, the character has moles or freckles or something. It's just not depicted on the cover. I'm always confused by that. Like, do you want me to believe in something that you're not actually showing me? Um, but we have this, this you know, I'm going to say off-putting effect, right? Something is wrong. Something is glitched. Um, I wonder... If, I, I don't want to read this too literally, right? I don't want to go, oh, so it means the photos are coming out wrong. But that could be it. Um, what do we think is happening in Room 9? I admittedly, I don't, I kind of want to go paranormal because of the, the glitches and so on. There's kind of this almost ghost adventures feel to it, right? You have this, we're, we're in a hotel or a motel or whatever, we're investigating. It just makes me think ghosts immediately, not because of this cover necessarily saying something, but because that just feels like such a trope of like, we're in this motel and there are ghosts. It is actually, I will say for the record, one of my favorite tropes in, you know, like fan fiction and so on, where it's like, our intrepid heroes have found themselves in a seedy location that they're just in for a little while, but now they have to solve a mystery. It's just so, so, so fun. Um, anyway, uh, so the, the ghost hunting, I have to second from, from Kyle again, Kyle with the, the great points. Um, also a good point that Kyle says that Red Dress is not looking at Gal on the right's eyes, she's looking at her lips, which is true. I think she's kind of watching her for a reaction, is how I feel about this. I think this is... So I would also guess that maybe this is our main character and this is her love interest. That's a good question. What do I think about POV? Could they, could they both share POV? I do feel like because she's looking right at us, that the cover is hinting to me to look at her. And then that this character is like, quote unquote, reactive. But I also feel like this is in a, in a lesbian sense, right? That like, in a situation that's tense, she immediately looks to her partner for support to figure out, you know, how are we feeling about this? What do we do? Where do we go from here? And I, I do feel like this character maybe feels like she has to be the other one's rock. You know, it's, we're in a creepy motel. I've got to protect you. I have a thumb ring. <laughs> is she also wearing a little ring? Oh my gosh. This is such a fun cover. Like really, every time I see this cover, I'm just so happy. It just looks so, I don't want to say cute, but it does. Even the color play, right? With the, you know, you, you kind of squint your eyes and you immediately see this green shirt. And so again, our eyes are led to this character as kind of a focal point, even though she's not, you know, literally in the center. Um, and then we have the red in the front and the orange and yellow kind of is the backdrop elements to highlight the accent here with the necklace and the text. It just fits together so well. I mean, you look at a good cover and there's, there's so much that goes into it. It's so impressive. Um, okay. Do we think there's anything else? <laughs> Guys, I've had green shirt's name starts with that. Gender roles. Yeah, maybe. Um, I, I think this is a, all we can really get from this. It's going to be really funny if we open it. It's like the thumb ring she got from her father or something, and we should have we should have gone further on that. But 
I'm feeling pretty. I mean, even just like the coloring in the face is so fun. Oh, it just makes me happy. Okay. Um, a guide to the dark. You can check out of room nine, but you can never leave. Interesting. Okay. The Haunting of Hill House meets Nina LaCour. That is a really, really good comp. I just immediately know what they're talking about. I mean, obviously Haunting of Hill House, there are ghosts, contemporary uh, women, girls. Nina LaCour, who if you don't know, is the... She's a, authored a lot of great lesbian fiction. Can we find some in here? Oh, I'm gonna look her up so I can give you a, a pitch for... I haven't read many of her books. She also has some great books for, for younger readers as well. I Have Read Everything Leads to You was fantastic. And this is what I actually thought of when they said meets Nina LaCour. I don't think this is her uh, biggest, most popular, most well-known book or anything like that necessarily. It was one of her, like this is how I found out about her in 2014. So that's something. But I think that, yeah, she's more well-known for Cold Steel, for example. But this one also has an investigative element. Mysterious letter from a silver screen legend leads, I mean, to Ava, where the main character here meets this girl, of course she's falling for, and they start solving her, like, family mystery, you know, Hollywood. This, this also felt very Nancy Drew movie to me, this book, in a very good way. So using this as a comp makes sense because we're not just adding in, you know, a, a contemporary YA LGBT author. We're adding in one who's written books with that specific, you know, trope of like trying to discover something together in a gay way. Um, this paranormal mystery, why call it about the ghosts we carry with us? Called it, the room is watching. Oh, let's go. This is a great point, actually, is that I, I didn't guess that maybe the room itself could, you know, that it could be a more traditional haunted house story, that like the, the house itself is the problem. You know, that it's not being haunted by ghosts, but the house is a ghost, if that makes sense. A motel located middle of nowhere, Indiana. Let's go. Is that she's haunted by nightmares of her dead brother. Isla doesn't see him or notice anything suspicious about Room 9. It makes me look run down, but at a certain time, she can't wait to capture on camera. This is really interesting. Eight people died? Oh, sorry, I was thinking at once or, or in general. Not that it's, you know, great if it's in general, but imagine if you were, in, you check into your hotel room and the clerk goes, by the way, eight people died in that room. Like, that would be my immediate question. Like, in a mass murder? <laughs> Formir becomes the not, oh. Gideon reference, okay. Whoa. Tender Thriller is the perfect way to describe what I was getting from this cover, by the way. Um, but the black and white shots, and that's very, very cool. So it, is, so it is also described as a horror, just not necessarily straightforwardly as like, these people are all going to die. Um, this is very interesting. So I initially read, uh, who I'm assuming is live. Can we also say, called it, this character's name is Mira. I don't know how you did that, Kyle. Um, <laughs> but there you go. I, I thought Lila would be more nervous about what's going on, but it seems like Lila doesn't know what's going on. Mira is just like, I have to face this issue head on by looking directly into the camera. Um, and Lila is like, I have to figure out why I'm so obsessed with looking directly at her lips. <laughs> this is just such a great cover. It just really makes me happy. I like it a lot. Um... Okay, let's see what I've missed in the in the in the chat. Eight is still a lot for one motel. Us on Disney trip, so true. <clears throat> you don't like it here as much as they're like I. I do. I think it's so fun. Showing the Okay. Anyway, I wahoo. Um, this one. Okay. I'm, I'm picking this one because I've seen a lot of these covers recently. There is a girl. She is looking at you. The illustration style is very detailed, but also simultaneously abstract, especially in a color sense. You have these like weird colors in the background. You know, she's not standing against a wall or, you know, in front of a, a an obvious setting. There's just colors swarming around her, almost swallowing her. 
I kind of love the texture on this, this sweater. Um, I also, the knitted text is really fun. There's something uncomfortable about it in a good way. In, in having the text look like it's been knitted. Um, almost like unraveled or looking at like the wrong side of a, of a sweater. Um, I have not seen this one in person either, so I don't know what it looks like. In, I will say one of my biggest disappointments for the stream was that a lot of covers I really like don't look good online. They just, you can't tell how fun they are in person. Um, and I was just like, people are going to think I'm silly for thinking this is such a great cover, but it looks amazing in person and immediately works. All right, let's see. So, psychological thriller is really interesting because my thought was, when I see these, I always think, okay, we're focusing on one female protagonist. I think social issues. I think, and especially that you know, you lose yourself to find the truth, but I think maybe she's gone through some kind of trauma. Maybe there's an assault situation, or maybe it's about standing up against misogyny. You know, I, I don't say in the workplace because, you know, it's, it's YA, but that kind of, you know, sticking it to the man, um, exploring what it means to be a, a young woman in modern America, that sort of thing. And definitely, I mean, especially with the way they've drawn her eyes, like the bags, sense of stress, social situation. I don't read anything other than contemporary fiction genre-wise into this, but I feel like she's going to have to stand up and either talk about something that's happened to her or stand up for, you know, women more generally, um, you know, find her place as a, as a feminist and so on, even when it's difficult to always raise her voice in solidarity. Um, the sweater is interesting. I want to take something to the sweater because it's, you know, a, a cozy garment, comfort perhaps, um, vulnerability. She needs to be comforted. All that's left to say, after what? You know, does, it, does she feel that something's been left unsaid? Or is it that, that she's been building up to a speech of some kind for a long time? So I, I don't get as much from this necessarily on the specific, but it... I, yeah, and I agree with Kyle that the pulsing, unsettling feeling. I also have to shout out Thea's, women never do anything unless it's about sexism, you've thought. But it's, if you've seen the amount of book covers that I have, that where the, the you know, main character looking directly at camera, and then you, you look at the back and it's like, you know, but when a new app is made by someone in her class to rank the girls at school by hotness. She'll have to stand up for not just herself, but all the women around her. Hashtag I'm with her. You know, it's, it, you, you see so many of these plots that at, cer at a certain point you're like, okay, there's misogyny somewhere in here. Um, ooh, yes. The, was the way the sort of wiggly lines in the background are kind of reinforced by the hair texture. Murder mystery. Okay, I've got to see what it is. A grieving girl willing to risk everything. There we go. Oh, it's prom night. Oh, it's this is this is perfect. Okay. I, yes, the, I, it's like I, I'm going to do a, a full bingo at this point. Okay. Um, I didn't mention this, but. I do think there's also often a played up contrast um, with, you know, like, oh, it's supposed to be the happiest time of your life, but you're dealing with misogyny. You know, like the, the idea that, you know, prom is supposed to go well, but then Carrie, um, in her fanciest dress, guys, this, it wasn't supposed to be like this. But she's soaked to the bone. That's not right. She shouldn't be all wet. She's wearing her fanciest dress. I sound like I'm making fun of this. I'm not. I'm just saying that this is like, you can see the way that it's playing up the contrast and playing up the expectations and, and playing on your emotions. Um, pulling the final on right as a poem. Oh, but Hannah had hers. So, okay. Speaking up, speaking out, you know, getting in trouble for what you believe in. This is really interesting. I have not seen a lot of, well, I, I'm seeing an increasing number, but still not a lot, of books about characters who are close to someone 
who is struggling with drug addiction, especially from what seems like a an empathetic perspective. I think that in the 2010s, so many books about drug abuse and all of them were, but then a teenager takes LSD by accident and now she's hooked forever and she becomes a sex worker. Um, and it, it's just boring and, and bad and very poorly written and, you know, entirely on shock value and not understanding how addiction works. So I'm really happy that we are now seeing books that are actually about like drugs in real life context, which obviously does not exclude books about main characters who are dealing with a drug addiction. But I think that increasingly as a society, we are reckoning with like, what do you do when it's not you and someone close to you and there's, there's nothing you can do? What do you do when you lose someone? Because a lot of people have lost people close to them from overdoses. Um, and so it's very interesting to see this kind of shift towards, you know, less sensationalist coverage of, of drugs necessarily and more everyday, almost quotidian discussion. Let's see. Fancy private school. Yep. Okay. We got to go into the institution. Uncover the truth. And also get classic like. I didn't think that I would be the one who had to stand up, but because of circumstances, I have to, you know? Um, it just, it's, it's all there. It's explosive end. Even if it means destroying herself, yep. It's fun. Okay. The door is euphoria open, that's very funny. Um, yeah, I mean, standing up and speaking your truth. I'm curious, Jandy Nelson sounds very familiar. Also interesting what's being recommended with it, because I would argue that a lot of these are, like, completely different from what I'm expecting. Shout out to Kaylin Barron. Um, I've read a couple of her books. I've only read one, actually, but it was very good. The Jekyll and Hyde one, and generally, you know, just seems like a great author. Always good to have more black author to succeed in YA and specifically she's doing horror. This one I think just came out very fun summer camp horror vibes. So I didn't, I didn't pick it apart because I know what it's about very well because I've seen it everywhere and talked about it with all my coworkers. But, um, oh, one of these is actually is on our list for later. <laughs> so this one, I know the book, this one I'm going to completely move away from guessing things. If you want to guess things, Please guess things. I'm not going to guess because I've read this book and I love it. I am going to talk about how this is one of my favorite book covers ever made. Possibly the book cover I feel most comfortable saying is like the best of all time. Um, for a lot of reasons. For a lot of reasons. So let's talk about the reasons. So for those who don't know, and if you're guessing, sorry, I'm going to tell you what it's about. It's about what if you knew you were going to die in the next 24 hours? In a world uh, where the mysterious company Deathcast calls you if you're going to die in the next 24 hours, um, you know, people have to, this whole society springs up around that, right? So there's all these different, you know, businesses and services and whatever else all surrounding that. Uh, Mateo meets Rufus through the Last Friend app for what it sounds like finding, you know, just someone to spend your last day with. They're both, you know, they both die at the end. I love every time I recommend this, people go, okay. But they, but they don't like actually. And I'm like, you know, I hate to say it, but <laughs> based on everything I just said about the book, uh, you could have extrapolated they do in fact die at the end. The most amazing thing about the book to me is that they die at the end and it still feels okay. It was really, really big during the pandemic on TikTok. And I think because people needed to read something about what if people die, how can it still be okay? And that's very much what the book is doing. So let's talk about all the things I like about this. And I'm sorry I couldn't get you a bigger image. I tried. I, I don't know why it was so hard. I actually didn't even notice this, that the original blurb is from Lauren Oliver, Before I Fall. Um, also, If I Stay, right? And I have not read If I Stay. I have really funny beef with that book, which to be clear is not, I'm just going to say what it is so it doesn't sound like I, I dislike the book. Uh, I read a Wattpad book called One Day, or maybe it was called The Day where a girl, you know, is, is shot and then has to relive her last day on earth over and over and over and can't figure out how to get out of the time loop. But of course she has to tell her she loves him, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
But I remember that the author had to put a disclaimer at the very beginning of a Wattpad book saying, I wrote this before If I Stay. It has nothing to do with If I Stay. People keep asking. I didn't rip off If I Stay. I just wrote this. And it's funny because, you know, as an adult, in hindsight, looking back at it, I'm like, yeah, this is, it's such a classic trope. You know, it's it's Groundhog Day. But at the time, I just felt so bad for her. And I I had this, like, little this slight anger towards the, the If I Stay fan, so cruelly accusing her of plagiarism. And I was like, well, maybe the If I Stay author shouldn't have published a book then <laughs> that had the same plot as this Wattpad story. Um, and that's my beef. So I don't actually have any beef with the book, but I think it's funny to every time I see it go, oh, and this this caused that one author on Wattpad so much strife. Whose name I can't even remember. So, you know, how upset could I have been? Um, but yeah, great, great pick for a, a blur because you want an author who does something similar. In this case, you have an author who also has written a YA romance about being about to die. I mean, it, you couldn't get a better blurb. Um, I love the giant skull in the background that you can see the, the you know big pits in the sky for the eyes and then the nose behind this stuff here making sure not to keep it too symmetrical, too cookie cutter by throwing in this giant skyscraper here on the right and the moon behind it to kind of unbalance the image. You've got the two figures walking together, which I'll say more on in a moment. You've got the Grim Reaper in their twin shadows. It just is so good. And the more you look at it, I feel like the more you see. It's just so pleasing to the eye. It does so much to describe the central elements of the book to you. And here's what I was going to say about the, the figures. Adam Silvera put up a Twitter thread before he put out his anniversary editions of a couple of different books. Oh, Moon is a Tear. That is really good. That is really good. Um, right, so Adam Silvera asked on Twitter, do you prefer gay books to be very explicit with their covers or very subtle? And the one that got thrown around a lot was Two Boys Kissing by David Levithan. Um, if you have not read... Boy, spoilers for the stream. Um, the classic, classic cover. Um, and I, I, this is one of my favorite book covers in the world as well. I like it more than this. I like it more than this. I like that it's literally two boys kissing. This was in like the 2000s. Like you didn't just have pictures of two boys kissing. You know what I mean? Um, and I... I say this a lot, but I got this book returned to the library by my mother because she found it lying around. I was like, what do you need that for? It's That's the problem with having a really explicit cover is that while I love the in-your-face aspect of it, at the same time, it leads to a lot of people dealing with more, you know, outward explicit homophobia because they're reading a book that is clearly gay. There's no deniability. Um, and I will just, one of my big hot takes is that I hear people say, oh, just get a, a, a cover for it, right? Like, just get, like, one of those textbook covers. Those people are out of their minds. I have never in my life seen someone using one of those. If you read every other book normally, but then had a cover on one of your books, I'm just saying it's not going to protect you from your homophobic parents, which seems to be the implication, right? It's just the weirdest thing that I hear as, like, a, you know, silver bullet solution. Like, just cover the, the cover. It, guys... You know, like, just take the, the dust jacket off. If you read everything else with the dust jacket and not that one book, and your parents are the kind that are going to be surveilling your, your media habits, that's not going to help. Anyway, I mean, it will help, but it, it, I don't want to... I think what bothers me is the um, implication that people who are dealing with homophobia in their personal lives either haven't thought of a really obvious solution or that there's totally a really easy solution. Don't worry, if you're struggling, you know, you, could, you can solve it really easily, and then when that doesn't work, now what do we do? Um, but coming back to this, th what I liked about the discussion was that people really emphasized that they both found it really emotionally moving to see covers that were explicitly gay, but then also they appreciated being able to fly under the radar. Um, let's see, I'm, I need to scroll through the chat to make sure I haven't missed anything. Title's pretty bold. Very true. I've been asked to hydrate. Everybody take a drink. I will also note that I did a lot of reading in the library, I think in part, at least subconsciously, because it was a place where I could read and not worry about my parents 
catching it because I happened to live close at the time to a library, which is obviously not something you can necessarily do if you don't live that close to a library or if you're not allowed to go out by yourself, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think this cover just perfect compromise between those ideas. I would say two guys walking together, very close to each other. There's kind of a romantic feeling to the cover to me just because of the stars and the cityscape. Like it, just, it does feel romantic, but in a way where, you know, you could say it's about friendship. Like you, if you need to, you have plausible deniability. Um, and I mean, look at this, like a bold, lovely and haunting story of lost hope and the redeeming power of friendship. Don't worry, mom. They're just friends. Um, but at the same time, you know, you're not, it doesn't feel like it's hiding that they're gay. It feels like it's, naturally depicting how these two guys look walking together. They're walking close together, but you know, they don't have to be holding hands to be a couple. Um, and in the book, they take most of the day, and I can't believe it, it takes place over one day, but it also feels so, you know, the, the literary sense of the word epic. Well, not the literary sense in terms of the Aeneid or anything like that, but it, it feels epic in the sense that it feels like it spans a really long time at the same time. Um, the, the sense you have of their connection that builds over the course of the book, where they, they don't start out, you know, leaping on each other and putting their tongues down each other's throats, unfortunately, but they get there. This is just the page if somebody wants to take a further look, but I do love this book. I love it a lot. I do not think it is overrated. Um, that's an interesting way of putting these. Okay, I was going to talk about this cover for one second, and I, I'm just going to say something that I think we've all danced around a little bit. Um, let's talk about covers that are not good. <laughs> so people really like to trash YA covers that are doodly, and that's fair. That's fine. You can, you can trash whatever you want, really. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You're welcome to trash covers that have purple on them at this point, because purple is a very common uh, book cover color. But I, it is Max's influence, by the way, I just want to say Theo calling out my Indian reference because of Max. Um, I will say, I highly recommend, if you look up, like, why book cover turns over time, um, this, I think this is the article I'm thinking of. Great, great article. They talk about Futura, the, the font that you're seeing or similar fonts, actually, they're not all the same font, but the, the style you're seeing. Um, and they, they go back to, we're going to talk about some of these, but they go back to these trends of really delicate scrolling, you know, kind of supernatural vibe, lettering. They talk about the stock image girl with dress thing. Let me tell you, this is not, this is not out. If you look up Kira Cass, who wrote, Kira? Kira Cass, who wrote uh, the selection, her latest book, oh, help me. I'm a fake fan. No, 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 no it's not this one. It's, it's killing me because I just shelved this book. Thousand Heartbeats. This book is very thick and the hardback looks amazing. Amazing. The combination of the stock art with this, you know, kind of the water flowing in. And I, I have to imagine at least some of this is like photo manipulated for the, the coloring, right? I also, I love this font work here where it kind of flows into itself. Very nice text work there. Um, this book looks great in person. It also looks great here. This is just some really good art. The, you know, slight, uh, the silhouettes of the mountains in the background is just, just great. And you can see how it's, you know, similar, but also very different from this kind of cover. This cover seems more dark to me, like literally dark in a lot of ways, but also that like, you know, the the, the drop shadow behind the text and the amount of contrast in the shadows and even the way the, the figures pose and the amount of reliance on the photography and on pretty straightforward photography. Obviously it's very brightly colored, but we're still working with largely a, a realistic image here of a woman in a room full of mirrors Whereas here we're now, you know, the, the doors flung open on this fantasy looking landscape, the color use throughout, it just is very different. And you can see that in this one author's work, how it's changed over time, or how it's been promoted over time, I should say. Um, and I mean, the women in water covers, I didn't even remember this, but yeah, this was a huge thing. 
the illustrated cover starting with Faulkner Stars and Eleanor and Park. Like, it's, this is a really, really good article for just seeing a bunch of trends. Oh, there's Adam Silvera also, more happy than not. And this is a great example of a cover he's done, or he's, he did design it, but a cover for one of his books that is not explicitly gay. And is it better? Is it worse? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's the cover that I think of for it, but when he was looking at redesigns for, um, for the, the anniversary editions, he was clearly thinking explicitly, you know, do I want, if there's going to be multiple editions of these books, do I want all the editions to look explicitly gay? Do I want some of them to be, you know, able to fly under the radar? It, it's a difficult question. Um, so I recommend, I'm going to just go ahead and, and link this. Shh, no, quiet, silence. Okay. Um, talk about Twilight in a minute. Goodbye, Ian. The A on her head. World Wars Um, I don't like this cover, and I, I feel comfortable saying that because it's just such a popular book that I feel like it's okay to say that this maybe isn't my favorite design for it. Um, I just think it says nothing. It it truly, truly tells you nothing. And with the, such a rich premise for depiction, it's strange to me that it says nothing. Because let's look at this for a second. What do we have? We have a giant flaming ball. It's in a design, but it, the design isn't an eye to me clearly. It's not like, is it a logo? Like, what are we, what are we seeing here? It's just a, a lot of fire. Cloudy sky. Oh, there's a dystopian cityscape. Look, there's a city, but outside the city, it's, it's murky and, and bleak. Now, granted, you could say, you know, the same thing for this. Like, oh, of course, okay, there's a boat. He drowns, so we have to put him underwater. But for some reason, I just look at this and I think it just, it says, it says so little to me about the book that it is, it's frustrating because I remember seeing it a lot before the books got really, really big. And every time I saw it, I would think, huh, dystopian and nothing else. As a teenager, I could not tell what this book was about um, from the cover. It had to be word of mouth only. And I think that that's really not setting yourself up as strong as you could be. Obviously, it succeeded, right? I'm not saying that, you know, well, the, we all know it didn't go well because the books never sold any copies. But it'd be very funny if you were on this this stream or this video and you were like, well, I, I don't remember anything about Divergent. Did it not do very well? Um, but I, I just think, you know, you have this society of choice and, you know, sorting people into different groups. There's just so much you could do with that in a cover. And I, I don't think they went there on the original cover design. I think it is really nondescript. And I think, especially given that it came out at a time with a lot of dystopian books, I definitely understand wanting to stick to, it's a dystopia, read it because it's a dystopia, but I also think, man, this book has a lot of things that are unique about it, and I think they dropped the ball not communicating that. Now, they do have a new cover that I really like. Um, they have redesigned all of the paperback editions, 10th anniversary edition. Congratulations, everyone, on being old. Um, and I like it a lot. I like the way Divergent is hidden behind this flap because you, you want it to be big so people can see it, but you don't even need to have the full text, you know, um, visible to recognize it's Divergent. I think that this cover is leaning very heavily on you already knowing the plot. Like I, to me, when I see this, I think about the film, I'll be honest. And it, it doesn't, again, like, this cover doesn't necessarily say a lot to me about the central situation to look. But we've got something. Two figures. Okay. Reaching out. Community. Joining a new group of people. A guy who pulls you to safety. You know, a guy who is your, your, your way into a new society, which is what four is to Triss. Uh, we still have this, you know, oh, the buildings are terrible because it's a dystopia. They're all abandoned for some reason. But the dystopia is, it doesn't feel like they asked, how can we make it look like dystopia and then stopped asking questions. It feels like they used the elements of the image to convey that. Um, I like the colors in this one. I like the illustration style. I kind of just like everything about it visually. The only concern I have is if you didn't know the plot of Divergent, is this the best way to communicate the, you know, being sorted into categories, whatever, whatever. 
But again, I mean, you have Tris here taking a risk, taking a leap. And I think that is really what the first book is about. And so that's fair. And I, I can't, I can't knock that. And I really, I just, I gotta say the the new covers are, in my opinion, very good. Um, are these new? Okay, those aren't, that scared me for a second. So there are new covers all of a sudden, but that's for the, the other ones, which notice look very different from these because time has passed. Um, and then I get, I think that these are supposed to be representing the different factions. I almost said houses because let's be honest with ourselves, they're houses, but I, it just kills me. It, I mean, look at this. This is our second book. Wow. Now there's a tree. And I do like the tree way more than the fire. I think it's way more evocative. But then it's just another dystopian cityscape. Guys, I mean, come on. They can't keep getting away with this. It just kills me because I think it's a good cover design in the sense that, like, it it conveys the, the genre. And it's it's certainly reaching its audience. But it, ugh. you see why I'm frustrated. You see why I just look at them like angry for no reason. Let's just show all the editions. Let's just wade through 200 editions, shall we? Um, oh, that's it. I'm not going to show you all of them. I'm just going to convey that there are many new redesigns. Oh, and we have a very small image here. But see, I like these so much more because it feels like they're building on the themes to show us one thing that happens in each book. Now, again, granted, I think this visual depiction of plot elements is very... You've seen the movie. There's a book also. But... Um, Anyway, I I like these covers a lot. I'm very happy they got redesigned. Um, I just like them a lot better. And I, even, I like that this is a, a very light cover. It's almost like deceptively calm. This is a very, you know, there's a lot of pastels, but it's, it's a very dark setting. Okay, here's Twilight. I'm just going to talk about Twilight briefly because I think it's one of the best book covers of all time. Um, it doesn't really matter if you like or hate the book. I, I just think you can't argue with the fact that the book is incredibly well designed. Um, one thing that I noticed was looking at the different covers, and it is so hard to find a high-res image of the cover. For such an iconic cover, it's near impossible. But I tried to arrange these when they were published. So this is October 5th, 2005. The hardcover, the original hardback one assumes. Um, and you already have the number one New York Times bestseller by Stephanie Meyer at the bottom here. You have this one that is, it's just set to, to the default January 1st, 2005. It, it doesn't actually have a, a date. They just have the year 2005 in the, the details when I was looking at it. Um, the first paperback release one assumes, you can't tell, but they also have some New York Times bestseller text. It's right at the top, the New York Times bestseller, Twilight, Stephanie Meyer. Um, you know, do we promote the book or the author? And here we go back to what I think is is more consistently the design we see now with the Stephanie Meyer, the international bestseller under her name, but still referring back to the title. Um, I just think, hello, Max, my goodness. I just think that this cover is the perfect cross between... Um, you know, tropey, right? It's visually tropey. It's using a lot of ideas that are very common. You know, temptation, sin, the apple, you know, it, of course, right? And this black and white, like, oh, it's it's dark. And you can tell because it's black and white with a red splotch right in the middle. Um, but also it stands out because I just, no one had done it. We've done a lot of covers, Max. I'm sorry. We've, we are finishing up our YA segment, but that's okay because you are here for Twilight and that's what matters. That's all you wanted to see. Um, and I do think that for Twilight, I'm going to say it, the books are Christian. And I think it's a really interesting, you know, opening sign of that to have this as the cover to immediately reference Original Sin, Temptation, Eve and the Apple. Also, I mean, food, right? And I, I might be going a little too far here in my assumptions of what this cover is doing. But the fact that... I, I'm not going to get too into this because it's really just getting into the weeds of Twilight, but 
I think Twilight could be very interestingly analyzed through a lens of, you know, how does it depict disordered eating, the way that all of the vampires come to the cafeteria and they, you know, pretend to eat food and they throw all of it out. It just doesn't look very out of place in a high school for whatever reason. Um, you know, the, the apple as temptation as something you're not supposed to eat, contrast with blood. Also the fact that Eve, you know, in theory chooses to bite the apple and Bella wants to be a vampire nearly from day one. Um, I, I love the title. I love how understated it is. I like that it's this, you know, kind of mythic looking font, that little curly G. Um, and that this sharp L looks almost like a blade. Like it just, it works for me. I just love this cover. I love, love, love this cover. I just think that it is so well done. I think it's so perfect for the book. Um, is Rook here? My goodness. Hello, people. Um, I, I, I just, incredible, incredible, incredible design. And I, again, example of like, ev you know everybody after Twilight wanted this cover. Everyone wanted to do this cover. But it had already been done. It had already been done by Twilight. Um, I also do want to shout out the fact that this saga, why did they call it the Twilight Saga? Saga, that's so pretentious. It's a series, called a series. But that it allows for, the also the way that it's like being offered. There's something almost romantic about the, the offering of the apple. I, fun fact, always thought this was Edward's hand until I saw this and I was like, oh, I guess those are maybe female hands and this is Edward's hand because it's reimagined. Um, so maybe this is Bella's hands, but it's like, it, it looks like it's being offered to you. Anyway, I'm going to just move on. The way that they kept the visuals with all the other covers with New Moon and this, you know, floral, the like tainted innocence, you know, the flower dipped in blood, Eclipse, the fraying thread, things can't last much longer. Um, Breaking Dawn, I, this is this cover is, I will admit, silly to me because so little is being done with the, the chess metaphor, let's be honest. Um, I love that this queen looks like she's being like menacingly followed <laughs> by a pawn from the other side. Um, I will I will give her this that you know, pawn into the queen, chess, you know, becoming your, your true essence, transformation, becoming a vampire. But, you know, I, I do think this is the one that is the least, not honest, but I, I just feel like you could have an image here that is more accurate maybe than this one. But maybe that's because I, I read the series and I was like, they didn't even have a big fight at the end. Um, Pomegranate, sim similarly, I think is a little, they're like, well, the apple worked. Let's do a pomegranate. And I'm like, no, you can do something else. Um, but for the most part, I just, I love these covers. I think they're done so well and they work so perfectly. Um, let's move on. We're entering, well, what genre do you think this is, guys? So, um, one of the things that I tell people when they ask me for recommendations, especially when they're like, oh, I like this type of sci-fi, but not that, or I like this specific thing, or this, this trope, or whatever. Every single time, um, I, my, the first thing I say is learn to read covers. Learn to, te to see what covers are trying to tell you. Because I think a lot of people don't understand, or they, how do I put this? They're not aware of the fact that the reason they dislike certain cover designs is because they don't like that genre. And the cover designs are working to keep them away from books that they don't like. Um, but also that cover designs are extremely helpful for telling what tropes are in a book, what tone there is. You know, it's just, this is your, your number one tool in figuring out whether you are going to be interested in a book. Obviously, you know, pick it up, turn it over, see what's on the back. But unless they don't have, a, you know, the synopsis there, in which case, you know, burn it. Burn the book you're holding. It shouldn't exist. But it's, I think, relevant that a lot of people don't, they don't, they're not aware of how valuable covers are in figuring out whether you want to read a book or not. 
and they just kind of think that they're they're there. And I'm like, please, please get into analyzing covers. I agree with Max that I'm not a big adult romance reader. This definitely does look, I agree, that these characters are probably little... Well, it's not that I... The idea that I wouldn't read romance about 40-year-olds, but they, they very much give me a... Do you work in accounting? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There's, there's definitely a certain type of, of lifestyle that I feel like they're appealing to with this image of this woman who's holding this, you know, tropical drink, who looks a little older you know, for a woman on a book cover, which, you know, basically 23, right? Um, even the style of the dress she's wearing somehow. I, I do want to shout out the body type, I think also is definitely giving more of like an, not an older woman, but like an adult woman, not a teenager. This guy could definitely pass for a lot younger, but I think in context, you know, these are adults. Um, I love the splashes of color given from this pillow, the beach, but it just, it, it's so fun. I love the way it's, the setting is so clear, the way the, the palm trees both come up in the middle here, but to not look too cookie cutter. Also in the background right behind the O, the way the O rests here on this hill. You know, there's, there's a kind of, even the font itself to me kind of screams motel sign, right? It, it says to me, you know, kind of California, like almost maybe distinctly Burbank, LA, Hollywood, um, I love the way the plants come up here and, and again, interact with the text and here as well. I wonder if because it's a Hollywood thing, I should take this, this tagline. She's written the perfect romance for someone else. If I should take it to mean that maybe she's a, a screenplay writer or are we thinking metaphorically that, you know, she's trying to set up this guy with someone else but then realizes she's into him. But it doesn't, I think this is a meeting a guy who was, who was a stranger to you initially but you immediately get good vibes. You immediately hit it off and you have a, a relationship that develops in a very feel-good, largely conflict-free way. You know, if you're not going to work together, it's not because, you know, you, you hate each other. It's because of, oh, you know, we're, we're both working on the same set. Let's keep it professional. Something like that, right? Where the, the conflict is not serious or, or upsetting or something like that. Also, obviously, screaming beach read, screaming summer read. Um... Emily Henry, if you don't know who Emily Henry is, one of the, you know, biggest romance contemporary fiction people right now. Um, I love that Kyle immediately said the dude looks like a Minecraft streamer. Maybe he is. Um, Cougar alert, maybe. Romance author could definitely be it for sure. Goes there for a break and meets it. That's really cute. That would actually, I could totally see that. And that's a big, a big plot for these kind of summaries. If, um, I think it Beach Read or Book Lovers, I'm not sure which one it is. I'm going to just take a look. Yes, this is what I was thinking of immediately. A romance writer who no longer believes in love and a literary writer stuck in a rut, engaged in a summer long challenge, blah, 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 and they fall in love. Right? So if you've seen this book anywhere, huge right now. Massive. Um, very, very cute plot idea. And I think that it is almost certainly kicking off, not like copycat writers, but it's, it's making publishers go, oh, we should publish more of these books about, you know, artists stuck in a rut, writer who doesn't believe in, in love. Like, I, I do think there's this kind of like meta approach to romance that is very fun there. Um, maybe I've extrapolated enough. I mean, they're at a motel. So are they on vacation or do they, do they work in LA? Like I, I have this weird sense that the workplace is relevant but I don't know how exactly. Um, I'm not going to send anyone to the principal's office for looking up the summary. Let's look at the summary together. She may have given up on love. It's always, I will say, and this is just a personal feeling. I personally don't like the giving up on love trope in the books I read. Again, this is not for me, so I feel comfortable saying that because I don't think I'm making some kind of artistic judgment. Um, the playing Cupid for someone else. What I say about the metaphorical setting up somebody else. Oh, there's a love triangle. Okay. What? Wait, stop. Can I not read? 
None of these are queer. It does not say lesbian. It does not say gay. Swept up by... Okay, so we're... I'm guessing Belle is a woman. I, this is an L, I'll be honest. The fact that I think that they're implying that... And I'm, I'm sorry to this author. I'm not trying to make her feel bad for being heterosexual, even though I'm guessing that's what Chad is doing right now. Um, but either this woman should be swept up romantically by a woman, or this should be a man, and this should be a... A gay, I, but imagine how, I don't know if that would fly. <laughs> imagine being like, oh yeah, my favorite book, it's where this, this straight woman, you know, sets up these, these two gay men and plays matchmaker for just completely different people from a, a different sexuality. Anyway, um, where was I? <laughs> okay, let's see. Right, playing matchmaker. Okay, written the perfect girls for someone else. Her sister's house in the Hollywood Hills. Hollywood Hills called it. And so we have this vacation sense. Interestingly, not a motel. Though, I'll be real with you. I, girl, if this is your house, I, I, it definitely does kind of serve rich people with a minimalist aesthetic. But your home, you live in a motel, just so you know. Um and that's not a dig at the cupboard. It's just like, that's literally what the houses in LA will look like. They'll just look like motels. Um, I was writing love letters and unexpected friends with a reclusive 82 year old film star. Definitely getting the Hollywood vibes from not to be with the palm trees, but you, you put these hills up with the palm trees in the back of a car. You know, we're talking Hollywood, you know, we're talking Hollywood. Um, feel good. What did I tell you? Sunshine filled friends to lovers. Falling for the real Angeles, but is that all she's falling for? Maybe women. No, I'm kidding. Christina Lauren. Yep, 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 yep. Immediately, just, I know exactly what they're going for. Um, surprised she's not in here, but Christina Lauren, big in, she's technically a general fiction author, but she is also, they, there are a lot of central romances. They're just more like feel good, chick lit, beach read fiction rather than explicitly romance genre. Whereas this is, I believe, ex explicitly romance first like that's where it would be shelved here's this i looked at this and i was like i have to talk about this on stream because i just immediately had so many thoughts um all right everybody let's do a poll first of all holy colors um let's see Can I, can I do polls? Wait, I think I can do polls. <gasps> Guys! All right, I'm gonna put up a poll and everybody is welcome to respond. Do not look at the Goodreads page to vote. If you are voting, you are not, you, you cannot vote if you have seen the page if you know the summary. I love you, Max. You're totally welcome to look at it generally. Do we think this guy's based on Adam Driver? Go. Because I'm really on the fence. I'm about 50-50. And you might be like, why, why are you even saying that? And let me clarify. <laughs> let me clarify why I'm saying that. <laughs> now, first of all, Allie Hazelwood is up here, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. I'm not saying it because of that, even though I'm sure it's priming me. I've gotten to the point where when I see a light-skinned, she doesn't even have to be white anymore, they'll race bend her, a, a light-skinned woman with brown hair and a bun, and then a, a light-skinned man who has this like strong jawline, the big shoulders, and, and dark hair. Look at the nose, right? Like, I mean, I don't know, guys. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm genuinely 50-50. Alan Rickman vibes, very... Very good. That's definite. That's way better than out of driver. I think you're you're more accurate with that. I'm so glad that we have Carly. That's what we need. I'm going to let the, the poll wind down, but I, I really could go either way. I'm not saying that it has to be that, right? I'm not saying that this necessarily is fan fiction that's been made romance. I just mean that the second I saw this cover, I just was hit with this overwhelming feeling of like, is it based on, not even that it necessarily was fanfiction to begin with, but like, is it based on the vibes? 
I like that Theo says that because I thought it might be Snemiony, unfortunately, when I started thinking about it being Snape. Um, anyway, it looks like we've had a pretty definitive result in our poll. Everyone thinks it's based on, not even necessarily Adam Driver, right? It's just like, it could be a fan fiction thing, but let's, I love that there's a trophy. Did we win? Does this, does this feel good? Did we win? All right. Let's actually analyze this because I'm really avoiding that for some reason. So I'm seeing a lot of color. I love the color and it's definitely a fall romance, right? I mean, I can see it with my eyes. You know what it really reminds me of, this design? It looks like a, it, you know, it's it's that romance illustration style, but it's it looks like it's adapting, interpolating, referencing. Uh, I'm going to see if I can find what I'm talking about. You guys know. Oh, it's not even, this is not. It's close, but not quite. This is killing me. You know what I'm talking about, right, gang? Blobby, watercolor... There are like tropes in watercolor. And you see these like uber reflective streets with the, the leaves reflected in it. And you know, the, the fall vibes, like you, you know what I'm talking about, like this, this, oh, there we go. This, 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 this exact style. I'm almost certain it's like directly referencing that. Obviously they've mixed it up a lot, but like, I think that clearly with the use of color where the ground isn't just gray, it's blue, it's a violet under these leaves, right? The screen printing, is that what I'm, no, the, the tone, toning, the comic shading effect, you know what I'm looking for here. Great effect. Um, I love that it almost looks like they're even floating because they've just been like, no shadows, no, you know, we're, we're not going to make it look like a photograph at all. We're going to be really, really stylized. I think that's just, that's so much fun, just like really, shooting for the moon on that. Benches to put us in a city, but still have the nature. Um, I mean, it just, it looks great. It looks great. Looking at these two, we definitely have this kind of like, you know, looking at the camera, I get this, you know, quirky vibe. We've got the, the Chelsea boots, you know. Um, it definitely is, it, it, I hate to say the, the like modern AU Ray. I hate saying that, but it's because I haven't even read any of these books. But they, they have this, this archetype that does feel like this is what we're going for. Um, you got that in Driver figure. Um, I I think that there's a, a tension between them. You're like, is it sexual maybe? But but specifically that I, I think this is like a, not a rivals to lovers enemy. It, it'll be marketed as enemies to lovers. But not necessarily like, they're not enemies so much as like nonstop banter. She's playing hard to get. She's doing the modern version of playing hard to get, which is, you know, he says something that's like probably inappropriate for the context. And she like, she calls him out. She doesn't let him get away with that. You know, she's still into, I'm going a little too far here, I think for, for public, but <laughs> um, I, I like people are saying it, it has this very literary feeling, which makes sense. Also, the, that's true, the kind of literary vibe of having the, the handwritten a novel. I'm getting a... So so you know the vibe when you are a cishead woman, and everyone on the stream is going to be like, yeah, every day. I wake up, and I am straight, and I am cisgender. When you are a cisgender heterosexual woman, and you want to read cisgender heterosexual romance, and you want it to be, let's be honest, normative, that's fine. You like big, burly men, and you want them to dominate the comparatively lithe, small, delicate women. Of course, that's fine. I, am I going to sit here and moralize because you have a preference? No, I am not going to do that. Now, the problem you're running into is that you go, oh no, the patriarchy, you know, the patriarchy wants me to be invested in, in a man defending me and protecting me and, and being big and burly and financially defending on, defending on, financially depending on him uh, because women are not, you know, supported in the workplace and under capitalism, everyone has to work to survive. And the way I'm going to work is gendered labor in the home. So they're kind of rubbing up against that that issue, and they're like, well, I don't want to support the patriarchy, but I do want all the things that are being laid out for me. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm still going to have the cishet romance and still the trope of the guy is bigger and taller and his shoulders are so broad. And Look at this masculine black shirt he's wearing. Why does this scream like software engineer to me? Do you know what I mean? Not in a bad way, but it, it really, it truly does. Look at his shoes. Man's dressed up. Um, dripping. I love the way they used purple to highlight here. Right, so I imagine that, you know, it, there's, I'm going to say, a tinge of misogyny from this guy. You know, I think that this guy talks down to her. And it's hot. And she's into it, right? But she's into it as, you know, she's going to call him on it. Their dynamic is that he's going to be like, oh, are you sure you can lift that big box? And she's going to be like, you'd be surprised, but I grew up with 12 brothers. Do you know what I'm saying? Her boss, no, oh, he could be, I don't, I hope not. I think it, the work partner makes sense. I'm reading a, a couple different possibilities here for the relationship. It could be a work partner. It could also be that they just met. Like, I, I kind of am feeling like they just bump into each other. No, I think that they ha there has to be a proximity element. There has to be forced proximity. Unless it's one of those, like, we met in the airport and now we keep bumping into each other. And if you like stories where they just can't stop bumping into each other, may I recommend Band Girls? I'm working on it right now. It's not out yet. It'll be out in the new year. But it's erotica about two girls who literally just keep bumping into each other. They just, that, like, every scene is just happening to be in the same place. Um, and they keep looking at each other and, and kind of acting uncouth, but in a very awkward way because they don't know how to talk to other human beings. Really serving the... I know that I'm crazy in love with you, but I'm also aware that I have met you three times all by accident and I, I can't call you my friend. And so I feel guilty about the feelings that I have for you, but I'm going to keep wondering about like what the inside of your elbow looks like in a short sleeve shirt or something. But I, I will also feel guilty about it and sort of mentally berate myself for having that feeling. Anyway, back to... Um, what Ali Hazelwood is blurbing here. Also, Ali Hazelwood blurb. Oh my God, Ali Hazelwood blurbing this says to me, you know, it's going to be marked as any celebrities. It's going to have the, the witty, the like, the banter. We're here for the banter. Um, I do love that she says utterly romantic because it is a romance novel, and so yeah, I sure hope it does. But it, it works. It works as a blurb completely. I'm just, it's funny to me because, as opposed, um. And I think there's a lot with blurbs where they, they say something where I'm like, you're just saying the book is good. <laughs> you know, like you're just saying, I promise the book is good. But let's take a look. Ah, I'm a genius. <laughs> I'm a genius. Can I guess that the commitment phobe is, well, I don't know. Do I want it to be this guy? I feel like she's the romantic because it's, it's so heterosexual as it is that I feel like it would be weird to switch it up. But I, I admittedly, and I'm, I'm about to, I'm going to lay my cards on the table. It is really easy to pull me in with the guy as a hopeless romantic because there's something like feminine coded about it. I'm just going to say that, right? Um, and so I do think it would be funny if he was like, no, love is real go on five dates with me and you'll see, you know, like I could, I could see that being, being the plot. Um, as to, I, I, I do think every man that I've written is a homeless, hopeless romantic, is a homeless romantic even. Um, Constantine after out of life chapter, I didn't say anything. Uh, until heartbreak, and I'm like, heartbreak, what the heck is going on? Enemies to friends to lovers, naturally. See, there's going to be a, a big bantery point here. Ari and Josh. I just like need to go into another room for like an hour. I, New York, I should have said New York. Interesting, so it is the other way. Okay, she's a comedian. That works with this, this does work with the vibe. Free spirited, what did I say? I said quirky, I said Ray. Um. Takes gigs and she never sleeps over up to her. No. 
ambition. This this works, right? And I could see this for this figure, right? Because he does have a like, I will dominate you. <laughs> it, it, it is smirk, you know what I mean? Um What? Wait, stop. What? Wait, what? <laughs> I would like to apologize to bisexuality. I'm taking a really long pause here. I might do an ad break because I just need to stand up and walk in a circle. Can I say something really bad about bisexuality in the Ray archetype? There should be a, a, a tip function on Twitch so that I can say for, for $5, I will say something really controversial. Okay, I'm going to say, I have noticed an uptick in romance novels where the central romance between a man or a woman and the woman is bisexual. The man does not have to be. I, I have not noticed such a trend in men being bisexual. And I think that what is happening here is that an easy way to go, oh, she's not like other girls, she's quirky, she's different, she's feminist, is to say she's bisexual, especially if, and to be clear, I am not accusing this author or this book of homophobia. I do not think that's what's at play here. I think the people writing these books are writing them because they're bisexual. I just want to put that on the table right now. This is happening from the, from the author perspective because they're bisexual and they want to write a bisexual romance. That is completely fine. And bisexual MF romance is fine. Um, Constantine if he was bisexual, but he's not. I actually, did I make, no, I think Glinda is straight. And this is not even the point. Um, the point I'm trying to get at here is that the publishers see a real avenue here, right? Because the publisher is like, let's really downplay the bisexuality. Mention she slept with a woman. The woman does not have to be a major character. We don't have to show her kissing or sleeping with or doing anything with women. So, you know, the, the straight female readers, they won't feel gross. And if you are a straight woman reading this, you can perfectly identify with her because, hey, she's into men the same way that you are. She's into a man right now. And it allows you to market the book both to gay people by saying she's bisexual, but then also to straight people who don't want to see anything gay in their book and who can only handle one throwaway line about dating a girl. And again, I am making this publishing critique in the context of the world we live in. I am not saying that if you write a book where the main character is bisexual, ends up with a guy, and has dated a girl in the past, that you are preying on... No, none of that. That's something that happens in real life, right? That people date someone of... Especially for monogamous people, like, you're dating maximum one person at a time. It's going to happen that bisexuals date a woman and then date a man separately and not at the same time. Um, and so, because of that, I... I do think there's this, this increasing trend in specifically in romance where it's so hard to break into the genre. It's so difficult for authors of color. It's so difficult for gay authors. You're just seeing this like this boom in like basically white gay books right now. Um, it's it's really tempting to the publishers to to market that way. Again, nothing to do with the author. There's nothing wrong with the author writing this plot. Plot is fine. Characters are fine character being bisexual is awesome. I would rather that, listen, if Allie Hazel wants to write a book where everything is exactly the same, but all the characters are just labeled bisexual, like they just say once I'm bisexual and it never comes up again, they never express attraction for the same gender, that's still better than them not doing that, right? That's still, for societally speaking. But I do think that we should ask a question of like, are publishers maybe being a little canny with this? Um, okay, let me keep reading this because I just never, okay. Whoa! Never expected to pass across again. I was saying I had this vibe that they were like bumping into each other. Years later, second chance romance? Hmm. Chance encounter. Too sad. No, so sad. Well, I didn't expect the amount of emotion, but I guess that makes sense from the, not to get the colors, but I think that this is what Max was pointing out when he was saying this looks very different from the other romance covers he's seen, that it looks a lot, almost darker. It just looks more emotionally complex. The, even the, the font, I would say, is very much saying to me contemporary literary fiction type of thing. 
Friends without benefits. This is kind of speaking to me. Do you... Are you against straight relationships? Do you think men and women should only be friends with each other? Bickering. Bickering. What did I say? What did I say? What did I say? I said bickering. Until one night. I, I bet people... Co-ed... The people on Tumblr who wish that men could just be friends must be going crazy. Now, I... Oh. My. God. Sorry, I physically got out of my chair and walked away for a second. <laughs> All right, that's a wrap. We can all go home, everybody. <laughs> oh my God. I want to clarify, I really have nothing, nothing against at all people republishing fan fiction, people republishing Raylo fan fiction. I have no problem with that at all. What I think is funny is that at this point I can spot at a hundred paces that something is fixed on Adam Driver. <laughs> Oh my god. It's an AU. It's it's Raylo, Harry Met Sally. It's AU. This is incredible. <laughs> I can't believe it. I can't believe I was right. I really thought like I was saying it, but I was like, no, it's probably just gonna try to be a coincidence, or maybe she was like a Raylo fan, but like it's not watch this not even be true. I'm gonna go ahead and search Raylo real quick. <laughs> with a hint of mumblecore, who are these people? I think with the combination of my voice being completely gone and how I'm, like, sobbing, laughing over Raylo, this is a very different stream from usual. Anyway, so I just want to say one more time. Don't be mean to people because they write things you don't like. Or even if they, they write things you think are, are, are silly or whatever. I think this is wonderful. It sounds like a very fun time. I hope this author does well. I hope the book does well. I... This is also very funny. Um, anyway, you know what? That's true. Better than Hermione Snape also. Because I really did think for a second it might just be Hermione Snape. But you you saw that I was right. Brown hair, bun, this dude's nose. I'm like, I'm finished. I'm done. The, even the like, this the smolder he's giving her. There's something about the way the eyebrows are set. Like, it's just, there's something about the chin even. Like, it, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about gay people for once, because we just need to... Well, I mean, I guess bisexuals, everybody. Um, this is cute. This is definitely the same style as Meryl Wilson's other covers, which is very fun. Um, when you are gay... I love that a novel's just written on her sock. I don't know why I like it so much. It's just very funny to me. The mix here of, like, the shading on the ball, and also the ball being, like, the two different colors is very fun. Um, versus the simpler shading on them. I like the chest freckles. I think it's fun. This is also kind of serving Ray, let's be honest. But that's all right. I'm saying it like there's something wrong with, with this. I'm like, it's it's okay. We can get over it. It's like, what is there to get over? Um, this one is probably the most straightforward of these covers to me. Like, I almost want to say they're rivals, but they're on the same team. But maybe they're both trying to be like the, the top star or whatever. There's gonna be there's gonna be banter in this one as well. It might not be bickering, but there's gonna be banter in this one. Um I it's funny because I pull this out because the the author's name is a little bit bigger, and I think it's because they're trying to remind you, hey, you liked her other book. Mistakes were made. Um another woman. <laughs> World's longest calves. Okay. Let's see. Am I right? Rivals to lovers. Ted Lasso and a leave of their own. That is brave. That is very brave. They're not giving you any books to go off of. They're just giving you shows. Which doesn't mean it's not going to work. Just that, you know, I think it, it says something they feel comfortable using two comp titles that are not even books. Um, okay, so they're teammates, but they're rivals. I said it. I said it. 
bold new upstart takes her spot. Oh no. Friends with benefits of the class clown, she sees her rival. Hmm. And I do want to say Marilyn, sorry, Marilyn Wils Wilsner, I know from a book I have not read, but do want to read, um, Mistakes Were Made. There's also something to talk about, which, which people mentioned, but I think that this covers pretty clearly, right? Like, look at, these covers go together. This cover is clearly saying, you know this author, read another book by her. And it works for both of them. That's a like, major shout out to the designer or designers for just how well these covers work on their own for their individual titles and how good they look together. It's hard to make covers look similar to each other without making the books all blend into one another. Um, oh, small. Good news, she likes someone. The bad news, it's her best friend's mom. I do want to read this. I think it's very funny. And I, I love the way they're like leaning away from each other, the way that the colors work. Uh, yeah, goes to an off-campus bar to escape family weekend, hooks up with someone who turns out to be your friend's mom, which I just, I love. I love it. I love the drama. I have to read this. Um, anyway, sorry, I just saw Max's thing about writing Flame is fan fiction. Runs into this synopsis and bounces off. I don't even know what that means for Max, but all right. Psychic shield. All right, Max is, is running away. We're moving on to the next part here. Contemporary fiction. I like this cover a lot. It really struck me when I saw someone holding it. I just immediately went, ooh, let me look at that. Uh, transgender colors, but I don't, I don't think it's a transgender book. It looks coincidental the way it's set up. I have to shout out the, the pink reflection on the laptop just because I have to imagine it's annoying to edit these things together. I like that it's simultaneously simple and complex. You have this very simple one color, another color, space in the middle, flat, you know, sans serif, bold, widely spaced text. But, you know, this figure isn't just wearing like a one color shirt. It's a photograph with a lot of detail and, you know, the, the stripes on the shirt, the way it's kind of falling off on one end not keeping it too symmetrical, making sure to break it up with the, the laptop over here. You know, the cute little award button. Um, I obviously, from the title and the cover, I think work plays a role. I really like they put the laptop here because it gives us more context on her work. Kind of, kind of like an office worker, maybe freelancer, but I, I'm really getting some kind of like going into an office vibe from this. Burnout. Um, I think this is... Unsettling, did someone say? Oh, it is real unsettling. That's surreal. I'm thinking, so it's literary fiction, and so I'm thinking it's going to be kind of a, you know, everyone's bad people thing. But, but, it, but pretty realistic fiction, and kind of just about the drudgery of everyday life. This woman feels like she's hit a wall. She's not sure where to go in her career. You know, she's she's been working probably in the context for a while, but, you know, she wants to break out of it. But how? One woman search for meaning in the modern workplace. What did I say? Um, convenience store woman meets my year of rest and relaxation. Perfect comp title. Like I just immediately get so much from that. Um, and admittedly, I was a convenience store woman. I think they're just trying to be like, what about books written by Japanese authors? But I mean, you know what? Sure. If if there's something that they're trying to point to there, and I haven't read convenience store woman or you know, really seen a lot about the synopsis, so I can't say whether there's, you know, no... It's totally possible the plot is identical, right? But I think that that's kind of what they're they're pulling on here is like fiction and translation. Um, my year of rest relaxation, you know, cynical, um, disillusioned, wanting to get away from the drudgery of the everyday world that you're stuck in for a really long time, the workplace. Original title, Konoseni... There's no easy job in this world. Pretty much the same thing. The young woman walks to an employment agency and requests a job with the following traits. It is close to her home and it requires no reading, no writing, and ideally very little reading. Very brazen also. That's a, a thing with a lot of these literary fiction books, is that the, the female main character is just like kind of nuts, and I like it. 
tasked with watching the hidden camera feed of an author suspected of storing contraband goods. Moves from job to job, not searching for his job at all, but something altogether more meaningful. Searching for meaning in the job line. Yep, yep, all over it. Magic, magic book, magical realism. Hmm. Shops upstairs to disappear. Seems like there's going to be a very light. That's the surreal aspect, I guess. Unsettling is interesting. Yeah, I'm very curious now. Rouge. This was interesting because I thought it was a challenge. I know Mona Awad. She wrote Bunny. And I like that they use this. If you've seen the cover of Bunny, you'll immediately recognize that they're, they're calling back to the handwriting font on it, right? The handwriting all over it. They've, they've brought it back here to go, you know, Bunny, this book is a completely different style. So I would have a different cover, but let's remind you of what that was like. Um, this is interesting because it looks, it's a jellyfish rose, but the font to me says like kind of retro, like there's almost an old Hollywood feeling because of the, the weird rose. I wonder if the jellyfish lends like a, not a sci-fi element, but I'm guessing also something maybe speculative, but it just, it can't be straightforward. Incongruous elements collide. I think female protagonist doesn't really say anything. Um, is she looking for fame, maybe? Maybe she's just traversing the, maybe it's just an exploration of, you know, I just want to see a character deal with what's going on in, in Hollywood. It does almost look like a drip. I really, really, really like that. Hello again, X. Horror tinted gothic fairy tale. I was not even close. Okay, Treasure's Path and Pursuit of Youth and Beauty. So I think that is where I was pulling Hollywood out of. Um, insidiously obsessed with her skin and skincare videos. What? Southern California. Hollywood. Strange woman red appears at the funeral. What? Lavish culty spa definitely works. This. The depths of demon of the glass jellyfish makes sense. Snow White meets eyes wide shut. That really fits the cover. Blood Red Rose, but also let's go. And the classic way to end literary fiction, right, is like holding a mirror to a bunch of things that are our themes. Um, I, and I'm gonna say here that things just get harder with literary fiction, right? I love this cover so much. I love this cover. I just, I love everything about it. I love the, the rainbow text, of course. I love the, you know, it's clearly a callback to Narcissus, but we've got the little Instagrammy heart. Um, and I think this is a perfect comp. It's just, it's, you know, cover times two. Gossip Girl meets the secret history. Modern, digital, gossipy thing meets more classic, you know, academic thing. I have to imagine there's some exploration of social media here. And so they want this cover that's saying, you know, we, we don't want to be cutesy. We don't want to be too cutesy with this. We don't want to be too fun-loving, silly, we want to, you know, do something where it's clear we're going to be literary and serious about it, right? But it's but we're going to investigate maybe the dark side of social media, the the humor, the surreal humor, and our relationships with social media. Reinvention of the myth of narcissism is a modern novel of manners. I didn't think about couples. New Yorkers, it's always New Yorkers. Blue blood pedigree, tech startup. Yep, 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 bingo. Management and consulting firms. Carefully curated. Picture perfect pair on Instagram. Becomes a visiting curator at the Metropolitan. This, this is a, this, the cover designer is a genius. This is amazing. The amount the cover designer managed to pack into this one 
one image. Really fantastic. Wickedly fun. Shrewdly observed. Yeah, that's that's genuinely like that's exactly what I get. Narcissism, desire, self delusion, the great see again, we're exploring themes. This is literary fiction, guys. Okay, let's see. That's true. I think that when I talk about comp titles, I am looking at them as a general marketing tool. You know, how do you give the exact, like, who's going to like this? You're trying to pitch it to people who like those things. Um, but I, I do wonder, I mean, I... Very often the books I like, I have no idea who's blurbing it. I have no idea what it's like or who, for fans of whatever, you know, I, I just, I never know this kind of stuff. Um, I, I should find a, a book I read recently and like and see what the, the blurbs were for it, actually. I'll try to see if they're, if they're, I'll keep my eyes open. Assigned reading, interesting. I wonder if I could think of a, a book but there are comp titles that didn't make sense. I mean, YA is the, the big one, really. But this one I don't think ever needed necessarily a comp title. I'll keep it in mind, though. I'll keep it in mind. Because I, I mean, this is funny, because your comp titles for this, in a way, one of them is Narcissus, so... <laughs> That's true. I mean, I, I haven't read either of these things, but to be fair, this isn't necessarily a book that I think is for me. I think it's a book that I think the cover is really good for. This one, I love this cover. I love this cover so much. I was obsessed with this cover, and it's it, it's hard to even say why, and then I realized finally, after months of seeing it, you know, in hardback, um, I, I will admit I don't like the paperback cover as much, I'm sorry. What I really love about it is the sense you have when you're walking by of emptiness. The sense you have of this sudden disappearance. Why are there floaties with no one in them? Right? Because if, if you were going to store your pool floaties, you'd put them somewhere. You wouldn't put them to just dangle in the pool. It looks like someone just drowned. And it, the, they're still floating. It gives it a sense of dynamicism also that you feel like you can feel them moving around. Um, I love the use of this kind of painterly style to sell the more like literary vibe of it without getting too far contemporary fiction. And, and this one I have seen synopsis for, so I'm not trying to guess anything, but it's pretty straightforward. I mean, Tell a tragedy, leave Sally's life forever intertwined with this. It's there's there's more I read a different synopsis that was that had more about the disappearance, but basically, literally, there's a sudden disappearance and they're trying to solve it. And it's in this, you know, suburban upper class context. And that you can tell from this from having this access to a pool that looks like this with these floats. Like that's all of this stuff is so well placed together and it gives you such a clear immediate feeling you know the, the contrast of where you would relax but no one's relaxing no one is relaxed in the setting something bad has happened um really just works for me having a cover without people but not one that doesn't need people one that very strongly implies the figures that are not present another one just to talk about how hard it is to guess what's going on in these books and I, I do have a theory for why this is, but it's very interesting how this cover, like, it's beautiful. This is a gorgeous cover, especially in paperback. Oh, I just, I love shelving stacks of this book because it is so beautiful and so comfortable to hold. And it just looks, it looks so nice. It, the way they're using the tiling. Wow, I love this image. Got drastically low quality as I zoomed in, but... It just looks so good. Um, and I like the contrast of, you know, still life and this very still, very static tile, right? It's it's literally, you know, 
it's stuck down. It's not going anywhere. It's, it feels like a very flat image. But then you contrast it with this parrot that's flying above the image. You can see with that shadow that it's not trapped in the borders. It's it's leaving. Um, which, you know, is kind of selling me this, how do I get out of the monotony? How do I get out of what I have always been? It feels very contemporary fiction. Uh, keep in mind, I mean, I was talking about YA and, you know, coming of age, but adult books are also very much speaking to an age group. They're not neutral. This is clearly... These themes of, you know, I've been doing this forever, is this what the rest of my life is like? Oh, I need to get out of the monotony. These are very, you know, prescient themes for the age group they're, they're aiming for. They're still tropes, we just don't think of them as tropes. Whoa! I did not know that it was historical fiction, but art historian makes sense for, you know, the tile here. Rubble of War Torn Italy. There's also something about naming a character Ulysses. You just, you know, as he returns home to London, oh, is, is it a little different from how he remembers? <laughs> oh, has to go on a, a journey. Mm. Beautiful prose, extraordinary tenderness, bursts of humor and light, all in this cover, all in this cover. And and I think what's happening with the covers that are a little harder to guess, uh, let's see, and this is definitely this is hard mode. I actually want, type out what you think is going on in this book and put it in the chat. The amount of times I saw this book around, the amount of praise I heard for this book, and I did not know what it was about. And I'm going to explain why I think that's fine and doesn't make a bad cover. I think that up until this point we've been discussing genre fiction and fiction that is heavily plot oriented. We've been discussing fiction where when someone says, oh my gosh, I have to read it, they then say, it's about, and they give you the central conflict. They give you the major thrust of the story. They give you, you know, quote unquote, something that's happening, right? Literary fiction is less obsessed with something that's happening. It's more obsessed with themes, with messaging, with prose itself, the texture of the writing. A lot of literary fiction, you know, if you were trying to just tell someone what the plot was, you would be doing it a major disservice. You wouldn't be pitching most literary fiction off of, oh, and this happens, and that happens, and this crazy thing happens. You'd do yourself a better job to just say the prose is really good, themes of loss, you know, the mood of the book, how is that, you know, what is the author written that you like. There's so many ways to pitch literary fiction that are completely divorced from plot, and it's because it's a different genre. And it's totally fine to have a genre that is largely not oriented around genre fiction's understanding conventionally of the plot. And I think that as a result, you can have these totally different covers where I find myself not being drawn to most literary fiction covers. And I think it's because I am really particular about plot. I really like my plot to be front and center, very engaging, very easy to follow, dramatic action. You know, I, I want there to be tons of emotion pulling me through the individual beats of the plot. I'm less drawn in by just themes. I want there to be themes. There better be themes. But I want to see them in the structure of the plot. And so I am not drawn to these covers because they're not for me. And that in itself is a sign that the covers are doing a really, really good job. Um, to talk about this one a little bit, I really like the beadwork qu quilting aesthetic. I like that it doesn't form any pattern that is too obvious to the viewer. So we get this patchwork sense. Um, we get the sense of craft from this for sure. I don't know if maybe, you know, there's going to be a major character if that is. And I do know part of the synopsis for this one, so I will say I'm not just guessing what the book's about here. And also that's one of the reasons I'm asking you to guess instead. But I see a lot of, you know, emphasis on craft and it makes sense for a literary fiction book because I'm guessing that the prose is probably a major focus. How good is the prose? What are the themes? I also want to maybe shout out that Louise Erdrich is uh, well known as an indigenous author and is well known for writing really good indigenous fiction. I wonder if that could be something that they're trying to lean into. I could be over reading here, but I've noticed that a lot of the time, you know, I mean, you could even go back to uh, the job one here, right? Where this woman looks Japanese, you know, and there's probably shots of women they could have used where the race would be more ambiguous or would look white or whatever, but they used a Japanese woman B 
because not only is it literally about a Japanese woman, obviously, but also because they are trying to market it to people who are interested in reading Japanese fiction by Japanese authors about Japanese people from Japan translated into English, right? And so I think that demographic is increasingly becoming a marketing, and, and by demographic, I mean, you know, like identity, like gay, you know, black, whatever, is increasingly becoming a selling point, and not just with the content of the book you're holding, but with the author's identity. Even though, you know, the, the hashtag of voices movement has kind of simmered down for a lot of complicated reasons. I wonder if they are trying to hint at this, like, authenticity, um, cultural craft. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see what people think in the chat. It's funny because I don't have the chat up in the recording, so it, people are just going to see me, me talking about these books. Good luck with that. <laughs> and let's see. Oh, I also like what Max said about it. still life that the birds painted that style are usually chickens or sparrows, not... Oh, this is not even a parrot, it's my cop. Maybe it is a parrot, who knows? Let's see, okay. Max, look at the start of this set. Why did you say that? Prison art. Right, I see that that was my first thought was the sentence. And I, I I suddenly realized I was reading it multiple ways that the prison sentence, you know, the death sentence, but also the sentence literary, right? Like, is it about a writer who's struggling with writer's block? You know, what's the what does the sentence mean? And that's one of the reasons that I gave it as like a a, a trick question, like, what do you think this book is about? Because I think that paired with the very abstract art on the cover, to then have a title that can be read, like, four different ways, uh, I mean, what am I supposed to know about this book? And I think that, to be fair, look at how big the author name is. Louise Erdrich is very well respected as a literary fiction author. You know, th they're selling it a lot on her name, and they can kind of make the book look however they want. They don't, you know, need to market it so much as like, oh, read this because the plot is really interesting. They can market it as, read this. This author is really good and you like her work and you know that she's well known for a reason. Okay. Small event bookstore in Minneapolis is haunted by an annoying customer. And so the, the booksellers have to solve the mystery. I've seen, you know, a, a couple of pieces of advertising things in the store and so that's why I know what the plot is. But I think it's really funny because you have this sentence of like, death sentence, but also sentence in a narrative context. Um, mystery and proliferating ghost story. And notice that again, as rich, emotional, and profound as anything Louise Erdrich has written, they're not pitching this to people who don't know who she is. They're pitching this to people who know her and like her and are saying, trust me, it's as good as everything else she wrote. That is, I think, extremely significant in the marketing decisions they are making. And I believe that's interesting because I remember the hardback also looking like this, but I could be incorrect. These are much more explicit with the, the book theming, right? That is a translation. And to be fair, we can see just from the El Fantasma de las Palabras that it's, it's probably a little more on the nose with the titling. Um, but, you know, having the ghost in the bookstore to be a little more visually explicit. This is still a more a more abstract one there. Also keep in mind that different countries often have different covers for the same book. I think the biggest offender is... Um, let's see if I go back to YA real quick. They Both Die at the End has a UK cover. And... I mean, that's, that's the UK cover. So in short, I think that there's, it's also worth considering, you know, what do different audiences expect in different countries? You know, you can't just look at a, a, a cover in German and be like, oh, well, clearly this is how I should design my cover in English because you don't know what's going on in Germany right now. <laughs> this one is hard though for me. Also, clap, Reese's Book Club sticker. This one is big right now. And it's, it's I just can't refer to it as the new Ann Patchett. I have no idea what's going on. 
We've got a painting. We've got flowers. Tom Lake is Tom Person. And this is his first and last name. Is, is there a lake called Tom Lake? Are we on vacation? Is it is that where our house is? Is it domestic? Is it what are the, what are the themes? Like I don't know anything. And I I was thinking about this and I was like, well, yeah, because you you just don't need to know what the plot is because it's about the the setting. I thought you guys would be proud of me for having the tab groups. By the way, everyone's calling me out for having you know, too many tabs, but they're all, they're squished, and they're all so good reads, so they're not taking up too much space. Um, where are we with this? Bum, 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 bum. Okay, yes. Spring of 2020. I mean, there you go, theater company called Tom Lake. You can tell there's something central that is Tom Lake, but you don't know if it's a character or a setting. A famous actor. This definitely does give the, the reflection on youthful and married love. Something about the like romantic feeling of this painting definitely, definitely works. Rich and Loomis. Emotional selling. Demonstrates once again why she is one of the most revered and acclaimed literary talents working today. Working today. Again, they're not saying, do you want to see a mother talk about? They're saying, do you want to read a good book by an author who's really good? And I think it is worth saying, for the record, you know, what does this tell us about genre associations, right? Like, they're kind of selling literary fiction as saying, these authors are just the best at writing. They're basically saying, you know literary fiction is a genre made up of the best books. Here we have the authors of the best books, who are the best authors, as evidenced by they're writing a lot of literary fiction. Um, I will, I will give Theo the Michigan pod that he's currently excited about in chat. Bum, 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 bum. And that's, that's our literary fiction section. That's just me kind of opening the question of what if you can't tell the plot from the cover? Not a bad thing. Totally fine. Um, moving on to mysteries. I love this cover. I love this cover. Oh, I should just open this. Excuse me. If you saw that, no, you didn't. I don't even necessarily want to guess what the plot is because I can tell you all the tropes right now. We're in a tight-knit neighborhood where normally nothing bad happens, but something strange is going on. We find out everyone is lying. Right? Like, I, you see houses in a messed up way. And also, the, I love the, the way that it makes it look like you're kind of looking up at a snow globe, emphasizing that, like, trapped in the community element. Um, surreal, upside down homes, you know, everything you thought knew. It's like if a suburb was evil. Um, it just, it works so well, I think. And I mean, psychological thriller. Oh, interesting. Finds herself the subject of her own popular true crime podcast. That is very fun. Birthday twins. I thought her children's school. Okay, we've got a very, like, Married life. Hiding some dark secrets. Her life and her family's life is a moral threat. Interesting, there's not really a mention of the community. Because one thing I've noticed is there are a lot of books that there's a house. Interior, but still a house. House with the, the yellow window. Big theme right now in history. More homes. I'll take a home for 500, Alex. This one's not quite a home, but like you, you see what I'm saying, right? That there are a lot of suburban homes and vacation homes. This is another one, that's a, to be fair, an apartment building. And I think it's very interesting that this is apparently about, among other things, gentrification. But house with one yellow window? Oh, a house, a house. Yeah, can we see another one with an apartment? Can we see another one with a house? It's top-down shot of suburbs. And such a quiet place, again, we're playing with the, the, the suburban vibe. We have all these, you know, the wallpaper in the house is is ripping. The, the house in the pines, another yellow light in the gloom. If you 
go into a mystery section right now. There are a lot of books like this. Um, here's another one. I mean, blue with yellow on it right now is just a big color theme. I think it's because you can make it look really cool and dark with the dark blue, but then you can bring that pop of color in for the title or for the author's name. Um, again, like this is just this classic, like, show me a house with one window lit up with a bad color. Right? Um, lonely, I definitely agree with the, the lonely feeling. Um, if you go in and you just start browsing mystery, One thing you'll notice, I mean, you can go to new releases, we can go to the popular ones. Why is it? There's YA in here. Get it out of there. Um, but you'll notice the, the blue and yellow everywhere. And a lot of references to wives, husbands, homes, families, in this specific type of mystery. House again. House. House woman. A stolen child. Right? Like, we get this, this sense of... Shout out to Randy Rubai, who's in this collection of middle grade... Middle grade anthology of diverse uh, fantasy. You should read it, and I want to read it. I'm really excited about it. Most read this week. Um... The, the blue and yellow, the blue and yellow is everywhere. Another building, though, this is a bookshop. All good people here. Again, we're referencing the assumptions we make about suburbs. Harris apartment. I think that the family upstairs, again, we're talking about families, neighbors, my daughter's boyfriend, the perfect husband, the summer house. Like, we're, we're talking about a certain lifestyle here, let's be honest. Prom, mom. So many of these are about connection to the family, to you know, the the promise of suburbia, right? That it's going to be safe and nice and you're going to be able to raise your children in peace, but what if you can't? Um, I, I just think that's interesting, especially because of, you know, suburbia maybe not a good thing to begin with. We're, we're so close to getting out of these. I even found this, which is a YA title by Ali Condi, who did Matched. If you're like, why does that sound familiar? It's because she did Matched. She did the Matched series. Anyway. Um, everyone disappeared. This seems really interesting, honestly. The like, mystery of like everyone's disappeared from town, and she's the only girl left. And again, you're seeing the suburbs with one yellow window on a blue cover. Like, it's a huge cover trope right now, because it works. Like, if you're someone who's looking for these kinds of tropes, like, you will easily find your books. Um, I'm, I'm genuinely recommending, if you're like a mystery fan and you want these kind of tropes, go into the mystery section of your local bookstore, look at the covers. Look at the covers that have houses on them. Because they're there for a reason. They're advertising something that you want purpose. And I think that maybe a misconception is that, you know, they want everyone to buy the book. On the one hand, yes, they do. They want everyone to buy a book and love it and make the money. But also, they are trying to advertise on some level honestly. Enough that they will get people who will enjoy the book, right? Enough that they will, they don't want this appealing to, like, romance fans, because romance fans probably aren't even browsing the mystery section. You know, assuming that someone is a, a romance and not a mystery fan, or a mystery fan and not a romance fan. To talk about some other very small trends that I've noticed, anthologies often have much busier designs. I couldn't find a, a just straight up shot of this one, but you can see there's tons of activity all around. Often these framing devices. I noticed this one has two covers, which I think is very cute. This is the one that has first kill in it, by the way, apparently. Um, which is interesting because, right, it is young adult. I thought that, but I was like, why? Why did I think it was adult? But you, you have this, you know, either you, you can center it much more symmetrically or you could have this design with a lot more busy stuff going on generally. But there's just completely different rules for these covers. Like, you would never do a cover with this much bouncing around for your eye if you just had one novel 
by one person, but because they're advertising, hey, it's a bunch of mysteries by a bunch of authors, they let you, by design, kind of glance at each of the little leaves and make each of them their own focal point. So that's something to think about if you're, you know, thinking about anthology covers, thinking about what rules exist for different genres. Because I would say that a cardinal rule of of a novel design is you would not want it to be this quote unquote flat. But because this isn't a novel, this is an anthology, this is the perfect cover. Also, everyone's already said this. Books by women, where the design is really blurry and colorful. I am sick of this, and I, I'm not saying that because the covers are bad, and I would especially like to call out these two books I've read, and I think it's not a coincidence that the two that I've read I'm, I'm saying are specifically good covers, but Vanishing Half is about um, twins who I mean, are, are identical, who grow up in a very, uh, in a community of very light-skinned black people. One of them, you know, basically does what is expected of her, um, but then ends up marrying a, or or being with a dark-skinned man and having a very dark-skinned child referred to as blue-black. And the other passes for white, marries a white man and starts living in the white suburbs. I really enjoyed this book, and I think that this cover does a really good job of the the racial politics of like you know yellow yellow bone like blue black contrasting those two together but with the same face shape bring in that, that twins theme and right it it works it makes sense for the book now granted i didn't know what this cover was depicting until i read it because i saw this so many times that i didn't realize these were even women i just thought they were blobs and I'm sorry to Brit Bennett for that. These turns of major, it has less of an excuse. I, I don't have a cover that I personally feel is my favorite for this book. And I think it's just because it's very hard to put what's going on inside the book on a cover. I just like don't know how to do that. And I think that this is probably my favorite cover of the ones we have. And you know, there's the kind of like overlapping experiences of womanhood, womanhood would make it weird. And I'm sympathetic to that, but it seems like in a crowd of these books, and you know, is it fair for me to say this is a downside also, right? Isn't it an upside that people know what they're getting, that it's going to advertise to other people who want to read literary fiction by women? But <sighs> it's it's just very... I think that one of my concerns is that I've seen people mention, are we just giving all women who write literary fiction the same cover regardless of whether they have anything in common? Like, that's a relevant question. Because when I showed you the other literary fiction covers, it really... Let me, let me show you. Like, this one, this one, and this one have nothing in common. They're all extremely successful literary fiction right now. And the covers are not even close to similar. So why are these novels? And I, I mean, like, I have to say, four of these five books deal with race. The fifth one is about trans women. Are we just making a genre of cover for marginalized women who write literary fiction? Like, why are we doing this? So again, it's not me saying the covers look bad. I mean, this one, I, I, I want to be like, oh, well, I get it. It's a snake, but from a distance, it just looks like a blob. But, um... It's not so much the covers look bad, I think. And I think this is also when people are like, oh, I hate these covers, I hate this trend. I think that they don't like the covers and more that 
there's a frustrating trend that maybe women are getting and specifically women of color are being kind of flattened into like one quote unquote genre when, you know, it, it doesn't really need to be said, but being a woman of color is not a genre of book. Um, so that's an interesting larger discussion that I would say that's, that's the perfect description that Kyle just said. It does feel like it's a generic for something that shouldn't be pretty much exactly. Like why is it like that? Um, okay. Let's, talk about something's not right. So the cover got redesigned, for those who don't know, for the fifth anniversary edition. And I started thinking about the cover again. And let's just be honest, this cover is not serving. It's okay. I designed this, you know, myself. Um, and I think that's all that needs to be said. So let's move on to the next one. I mean, no, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this. The book that inspired me to do this, to put out as an art, was The Dark Night of Love Stories. Because I realized, like, oh my god, I have all these short stories, like, why don't I just put them together? And I took some inspiration from this and from other similar covers. And I, I did do this, you know, with some research. I think not enough and not very good research. But I made it, you know, thinking about that kind of dark background, focus on the text. I realized that, to me, it felt like short story collections were easier to cover because you didn't need, you know, a central human figure. You could have a, a more symmetrical design. You could have just an image and text on top of it. Almost anything made sense. I had a, a bunch of different drafts for that original cover. Some of them were, um, I think there was one that was like a picture of fireworks. And then again, just that, that typical cover over it. I think the big mistake is of course this, this green blob, how awful, but I like where I was going with the, the band around it. Like that's something that I didn't just make up. That is something that, you know, I've seen on, on covers before. And so it kind of makes sense. Um, but this is, this is a cover that I like a lot. The dark and other love stories. The collection is occasionally speculative, but with a strong focus on, on realistic fiction, on character dynamics. That's something that I was definitely drawing on um, in my writing as well. I, I also really like this book. I mean, needless to say at this point, um, this I read after and I, I remember wanting to get it at the library and it was on hold and so many people were in line for it. There were like 20 people in line. It took me so long to read it, even though I had on hold practically from release date because it was just, it was so popular. Um, I love this cover so much. I love the way that the text, and this is what I'm saying about seeming simpler because the text here doesn't interact with the art. It's just text on top of art. But I love the way that this looks simultaneously to me like a course and like a bone. I like the the green ribbon, which of course references the the central story of the collection, the husband stitch. Didn't even notice that Alexander Chi was the the uh, blurber for lack of a better word for this, but works perfectly. Um, you know, this, this folks on a, a dark cover, lighter text, make the text really big, say somewhere that stories, say the author. That was my vibe. This one I didn't I didn't really reference, but I, I just love this cover as a short story collection cover, and I have to bring it up because it is something I was thinking about. Um, you know, white text, dark background. I do think this is just a gorgeous cover. Very rarely do you get a cover that just so perfectly works. The way that it looks like a clock without the numbers, and it's it's both imitating the minimalist feel of a clock without numbers, while also obviously not being a clock at all. Right? Like it's, they just put, they're not going to have numbers. This cover was never going to have numbers for the clock because it's not about the numbers, it's about the title. Um, and, and then arranging that information such that it is readable the way that you would read a clock, also just, just brilliant. Um, and then stories of your life mixed with the clock theme, perfect. The way that this cover starts dark and moves light and the text starts light and moves dark, it is just so, so, so good. It is such a perfect cover for the book. Um, there's this one exhalation that I was thinking about because again, dark background, light text. This is about as simple as you can get, right? I like that the the stars maybe here look like they're being breathed on, that they're floating away with the wind, which works perfectly for exhalation. Um, it just it you can see this this theme, this growing theme of dark background, light text, make the text really a, a statement piece. 
same here. Here you get some of that stuff that I love where the, the text is interacting with the art on the cover, and I just love to see it. I think it's also an interesting compromise because of the backdrop here where there's a very abstract kind of design in the background that is not interacting with the text, but then some of these dots are over the text. Some of the dots are over, some are under. Um, are all of them over, actually? No, this one's, oh, maybe all of them are over. I think this one's tucked underneath a little bit. And so you have this feeling of multiple layers, and so it doesn't feel quite as flat. It feels almost to me like light box maybe I don't know um I love the the texture here with the little the almost paper cutouts just feels so crafty and cut and paste um this one I just adore this cover this is the gold standard for me of text interacting with the image because this looks like it took so long and was so difficult unless they literally printed out. I, mean, I know there's no way they had to have done this digitally the way it's wrapped on this one it just is perfect it's perfect i love the way this book looks like something else i love that it looks like a bag of oranges it's just so attractive so appealing one that i would like to to point out heartbroke similarly i will find it you can't stop me um this covers interaction with the text white text, not a dark background, but I just, the choice of candy hearts really works with the, the heartbroke as a title. Um, and I will say this is an author whose other book, God Shot, that I know there may be even more. Um, no, it's just those two for now. Also has lovely, lovely cover where the text is interfacing with the stuff around it, where it looks really physical and present and real. Um, it just looks, it looks fantastic. It really is just an immediate statement. And I think that's what you want, especially if you're working with this kind of literary speculative vibe, you really want people to go, whoa. Um, Fates and Furies is a cover that I thought a lot about during this process because I was looking at a hardback of this quite often. Um, I saw this at a thrift store and I, I didn't buy it because I was there scouting for the bookstore. I was, you know, buying used books that we could resell. And I was looking and this one was in hardback and we, we don't generally take used hardbacks when the paperback is out because they just don't sell. Let me see if I can get you a, a good photo because it's really hard to get a sense. It's, it's quite nice how, how thick it is. I like that the text literally just like crawls off of the book. You know, you, you hold this book in your hands and it's the it's too big for itself. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's so exciting to me. Um, the real sense you have here that the story is jumping out of the book. Um, and I mean, there, there is a sense of, you know, because of the, the complicated marriage, bursting out of your boundaries. And again, you know, can't say it enough times. The waves are covering up the text in places wonderfully, beautifully integrated. And I just wanted to, to shout out Arcadia, which has a matching cover, did not originally. The original editions had a different cover, but they changed it to go, wow, okay, that's a really small cover. Uh, can I get a sizable cover, please, please? No, no, I cannot. But you, you see what I'm going for here, hopefully, that we're doing this, you know, text is being swallowed up by the surroundings, in this case, the leaves. I was really inspired by this in terms of what I wanted for the fifth anniversary cover. And I made a, a mock-up that I sent to the cover designer who, uh, thank God, made it good. Because, you know, I, just, I had no idea what I was doing, for real. I was just like, put the ferns, make it, they have them touch the text, make it look 3D. Um, but we are at the end of the stream, and so we get the special announcement, which is the cover reveal for the fifth anniversary edition, which you can now add to your want to read on Goodreads and Storygraph. I had a little trouble updating it on Storygraph, so if you have any trouble with it, or if you just 
are like, this is wrong, I need to fix it, feel free to fix it on Storygraph. I'm not on there often enough to know how it works. But this is the cover. Can I open it in full size? Yes! Um, there may or may not be a blurb here in the middle. We're still working that out. But look at it. Like, hello. The analysis? I, I don't even know if I have analysis. I mean, I think I just gave it. You want... I mean, also, huge, huge, huge shout-out to the cover designer, uh, Rachel A. Rosen, who figured out the perfect thing to do with the text, right? Because I struggled a lot when I was trying to design my cover with, with spacing and trying to make something not look squashed, but make it the same uh, width as not right. Just really difficult to do. Um, it looks great here. The anniversary edition text at the top, stories by Eve's on at the bottom, um, I wanted ferns. I got ferns. I got so many ferns, guys. Ferns out the wazoo. Uh, and the ferns do reference... Oh, that's true. The ferns do reference a story in Something's Not Right. Don't feel guilty. Um, oh, yes, it's true. There was another cover that I, I'm not showing just because I don't know I'm allowed to. I don't think there's anything against it, but I... And it looked a little more hard sci-fi than I think I was going. So we have this. Um, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about how the cover looks. I really like how it looks. I'm curious whether it, it accurately portrays the book. We'll just have to see how the marketing goes, what people expect. You know, this is one of the reasons that if you say in a Goodreads review, you know, I was expecting blah, blah, that's actually very helpful to me because I do read those reviews. Um, and it does help me to know, oh, I thought this was going to be, you know, hard sci-fi, and it's not. I don't know why it was marketed that way. That's a note to me that I've done something wrong. So, or, you know, in, in my case, because I'm, I was self-published, and now I'm going to be indie published, obviously, if you're commenting on freaking Arcadia, like, why did Lauren Groff personally Photoshop her cover this way? She didn't, and it won't help to say that. But in, in certain contexts, it's very helpful to just give an opinion on how marketing affects your view of book. Also because someone else might read your Goodreads review and go, oh, it's not hard sci-fi? Oh, okay. Read the book and then go, I'm glad I went in knowing it's not hard sci-fi because I like both hard sci-fi and the genre this is, but I would have been disappointed going in with just that marketing. So even a review that ostensibly seems negative can be really positive overall. Um, guess what else? Because the cover is out, because I got permission to share the cover, I kind of think the time has come for ARC calls. So if you're just joining us and you have no idea who I am or what I'm talking about or what this book is or why the cover matters, hi, um, I'm Eve Zoss. <laughs> I write books. The one book I have that is out is Something's Not Right. It was originally self-published in 2018, and you know, good for me. But I do think that it helps to have a little more heft behind your, your publishing effort. And I have gotten picked up by the indie press Trom Books. They are awesome. Their whole thing is just like, if the book is too weird for traditional publishing. And that's exactly how I felt about something's not right. I just felt like there's no way I could ever get this traditionally published. There's no way I could get these stories traditionally published. Um, it, I definitely feel differently about it now that, you know, Carmen Machado is huge and, you know, there's a ton of super on the border, on the edge, speculative literary stuff happening. You know, a lot more queer fiction as well. But when I, when I was writing it and putting it together, I just didn't feel as confident in being able to sell it that way. And so I had to self-publish it. I'm still happy with the book. However, I did feel that, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you read typos, you're going to have a typo. And I wanted that, you know, actual, I wanted an actual editor to look at it. And I also wanted to go ahead and clean up any major, you know, plot holes or any sentences that were just like nonsensical, like you couldn't tell what I was referring to. And I will say to my credit, there were very, very few instances where I really was like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. 
I think I really largely could have left it alone. A lot of my edits were trying to clean it up and say, okay, if you don't know who I am, if you don't know who Eve's is, and I'm still trying to pitch this to you, how I have to be really professional, I have to make it really best foot forward. But at the same time, um, I wanted to make sure that if you like the original, and I like the original, that I would not change anything in a way that would ruin it for you. You know, if you, if you lost your original copy of the book, and you were like, I have to rebuy it. Oh, I found the anniversary edition. Maybe I'll just get that one. That you wouldn't be holding a book that wasn't what you wanted it to be. Um, especially because I do owe the people who read the original book a lot. That's why I have any following at all. Um, that's why I have Max. So, okay. If you want to have an arc, the one major disclaimer is City Publishing. Everything hits the fan always. We don't have a perfectly formatted, gorgeous cover included, everything's done perfectly arc. It is not traditional arc. What we do have for you is the file initially edited. There may still be some typos, but we are only proofreading at this point for typos. So the, the actual phrasing, the prose, the content of the stories, that is all done. There are three new stories. So if you've already read it and you're like, oh, well, I've already read it, there's three new stories, and you can review it based on those stories alone. Um, if you've already read it and you don't care about the new stories, but you do wish that Avner was in it, there's also some new endings. Only one. And that was my, my really big change where I was nervous that people were going to be like, no, I like the original ending. But I, I think I've improved it a lot. I think that it keeps the best of the original ending and just makes it better. Um, and if you're just like, what is this book about that you're pitching? Great question. It's a short story collection about a diverse cast of human and non-human characters dealing with what society considers right. Um, there are some recurring characters, some recurring themes. I've been describing it recently as if we took the YA, devil may care, whimsy, I write for fun and to be entertained and brought it to literary speculative fiction, that's what I think is going on with the book. Um, there's a range of ages for the different characters, but there's definitely a, a sense of almost innocence to it, of just like, I am having fun. A lot of the stories that I wrote for this, I mean, they didn't even come out of, you know, my making a collection. I looked through what I already had. And so a lot of those stories were written just because I enjoyed writing them. And with no perception of anyone seeing them, no perception of putting them in a book, of them having to be good. And I selected the stories that were good from that. And... I'm very proud of the result. I think that it's a really good example of how you can have something that's kind of a sketchbook and goes all over the place and it's experimental and fun and silly, but also is still of high quality. That's just my opinion, though. I would love to hear yours. If you would like to read the book in advance of its October 10th, 2023 publication date and tell me what you think. Um, so there's a Google form. If you're a Book Sirens person, we will have a Book Sirens link. That one will go up by mid-September is our current thought. We don't have exact dates. Everything is everything all the time. Um, we should also then have the, the proofread version out at that time. So you are welcome to fill out the Google form and say, I don't want your whatever is going on right now. I want the completely, the beautiful finished digital arc. That's completely fair, and you're welcome to say that. And what I will do is I will email you when we have that, and I'll email you the file. You're also welcome to say, no, I want it right now. And you're also welcome to say, I want both. You're totally, you can absolutely do that. Um, I'm happy to send you the first one now, and then the, you know, fixed up typo edited version when that exists to the same email. Um, I am asking for emails just because I think it's a little easier to keep track of. As much as I love everyone, I want to talk to everyone on Discord. And I'm also including a box where you can, you know what, let's open this form right now. Let's open this form. I don't know why we're not doing that. We could really have a discussion about why it looks the way it does. Why do I have so many tabs? It's funny I say that now. But look at how well I organized them, right? Um, yes, okay. Let's go through this form very quickly. Advanced review copy. Do you want one? Come to this form. We have the link to the Tumblr post about it. So you can also go back there. You can send me an ask, DM me. You can ask 
in the Eve's Chord, email me. I am generally contactable. Always, if you have a question, just ask. I'm not going to be mean to you. Um, I am taking a policy of no one being rejected. If you want an ARC, you get an ARC. I am not doing this because I want to be the richest person alive. If you want a free copy of the book, ask for a review copy. I will give it to you. Um, it is not a final copy, but it is a free copy of the book, and you can read it for free. Would I like you to review it? Yes, of course. That's It's in the name. Do you have to? No. No, of course not, right? If you read it and you go, my feelings are too complicated. I can't even figure out what to say. I'm not going to say anything. If you want to write a review, you get nervous. Whatever. Like, I, I get it. I would say, as much as possible, reviewing in any way, shape, or form is better than not. Even if your review is, I didn't like it that much. It helps just so that when people click on the Goodreads or Amazon link, they see it's a real book. And you never know when your review saying, this was not for me, might help someone else realize it's not for them and then not end up reading a book they don't like. I have no interest in people who don't like it reading it, right? So any feedback, any format, post it to Goodreads if you want, post it to TikTok, do a video review on Tumblr or on YouTube. I don't care. Any site is fine, no matter how niche. Um, any format is fine, no matter how weird, length, whatever you want to do. You can give me a one-line review. You can write five pages on it. You can do anything you want. Um, the only reason that I'm asking is because I would like to know, for example, if I see everyone's responding saying, oh, we're all going to review on Goodreads, then I might say to myself, okay, let me think. Can I hit up anybody on Tumblr and say, would you be willing to post your review here, right? Is there anyone I know who has a TikTok account who's interested in promoting the book there? So that's my only thing is that I would like it if you can let me know what your plans are. If you say, oh, I'm going to post TikTok for sure, and then your account gets deactivated, you never return, th that's fine. That's completely fine. I'm not expecting anyone to know what their life is like for the rest of eternity. All I'm asking is, if you have a sense, let me know. If you don't have any sense, you're totally welcome to just click your guess is as good as mine. Or, heck, I'm not going to review it. Because I said no one would be rejected, so I guess I have to stick to that. Um, the email for the copy, pick whichever one you want. Pick both, pick neither, whatever you want to do. I mean, well, neither you can't really... I mean, what am I going to send you say neither? A picture of a dog. Hence required question. I am hoping to do a book tour on Tumblr. Um, if you would like to, to host an SNR post on your blog, and this might be, I'm still working on what this is going to look like. Like maybe there might be a like five questions for the fifth anniversary with Eve's dog, right? Or like maybe it's, you know, a meme that you made for it. I'm just going to do a thing where I have probably a week's worth of posts going through different people's blogs, right? So I might say today's stop is on Max's blog, right? And then I would reblog a post from Max where he has this content that we've made together about SNR and it sends people to him from me to go, oh, who's this cool book blogger who I love and want to see more from? And people who follow Max are like, what's this book he's talking about? They go to me. So if you want to be part of that, let me know. You can also always, if you fill out the form and then you're like, oh my God, I was hit by a car and it made me have a realization that I don't want to be a part of this or I do want to be a part of this or I want something else. You can always ask me later. You can always send me an ask. You can always ask me on, on the Eve's Chord, private Discord, anything. Never be afraid to say, I have a piece of information or I have a question at any point in the process, including before, if you are looking at this form right now and you're like, you missed a really obvious question, you can just tell me that. I'll put it in. Um, and additional notes. If you if you have something that doesn't fit in these categories, I go for it. Go crazy. Um, but that's the, the major elements of the form. And I think that's that's really everything for today. We are, I mean less than two months out from the book being real. Just saying. Oh. It looks like Kyle gifted a, a tier one sub to Theo so they can be subscribers together. Thank you, Kyle. Okay, I think that's, that's all there really is to say. So I'm going to wrap up here. Whether you are live or watching the three hour recording on YouTube. Oh my 
God. Sorry, there's a hype train happening. Thank you, Kyle. You're very sweet. Wow. Um, everyone's getting gift subs all of a sudden. Merry Halloween. Um, thank you so much for coming, for watching. Especially if you watched all the way through, my goodness. Uh, much more going on on Tumblr. Come to my Tumblr. Go to my Tumblr. Visit my Tumblr. You can do so. Eves.tumblr.com. Many big changes happening over there, by the way, in the coming weeks. I let I'm not signed in, so it's telling me to do that. Um, but if you're not signed in, don't worry. It's very navigable. You want to know who I am? Look at this. You want to know what I'm working on? Look at that. My book? Guess what? That's where it takes you. Um, everything's all set up here. I have a Patreon. You can pay me money. Right now, I'm working actually literally today on a post of the aforementioned Band Girls piece. We're getting an excerpt that was originally handwritten that, thank God, I have now typed and fixed. Now it has feelings in it, but before it was just kind of a bundle of... Uh, type on the ground. So if you want more, subscribe to the Patreon. Starting at one dollar. That's just a just a Patreon. How much could it cost? One dollar? Thank you so much for coming. I'll see you in the next one.